Chapter Fifteen of By Pike and Dyke: A Tale of the Rise of the Dutch Republic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By Pike and Dyke by G. A. Henty. Chapter Fifteen: Ned receives promotion. It was fortunate for Ned that the watch round the city had relaxed greatly when he started from it. The soldiers were discontented at the arrangement that had been made for the city to pay an immense sum of money to escape a general sack. They were all many months in arrear of their pay. They had suffered during the siege, and they now considered themselves to be cheated of their fair reward. The sum paid by the city would go into the hands of the duke, and although the soldiers were promised a share of the prize money, the duke's necessities were so great that it was probable little of the money would find its way into the hands of the troops. A sack, upon the other hand, was looked upon as a glorious lottery. Every one was sure to gain something. Many would obtain most valuable prizes of money or jewelry. No sooner, therefore, had Harlem surrendered than a mutinous spirit began to show itself among the troops. They became slack in obeying the orders of their officers, refused to perform their duties, and either gathered in bodies to discuss their wrongs or sulked in their tents. Thus the work of keeping a vigilant watch round the walls by night to prevent the escape of the victims selected to satiate the vengeance of Don Frederick was greatly relaxed. After lowering himself from the walls Ned proceeded with great caution. On reaching the spot where he expected to meet with a cordon of sentries, he was surprised at finding everything still and quiet. Unaware of the state of things in the camp, and suspecting that some device had perhaps been hit upon with the view of inducing men to try to escape from the city, he redoubled his precautions, stopping every few paces to listen for the calls of the sentries, or a heavy tread, or the clash of arms. All was silent, and he continued his course until close to the camps of some of the German regiments. Incredible as it seemed to him, it was now evident that no sentries had been posted. He saw great fires blazing in the camps, and a large number of men standing near one of them. They were being addressed by a soldier standing upon a barrel. Keeping in the shadow of the tents, Ned made his way close up to the group, and the similarity of the German language to the Dutch enabled him to gather without difficulty the meaning of the speaker's words. He was recounting to the soldiers the numberless toils and hardships through which they had passed in the service of Spain, and the ingratitude with which they were treated. They pretend they have no money, he exclaimed. It is not true. Spain has the wealth of the Indies at her back, and yet she grudges us our pay for the services we have faithfully rendered her. Why should we throw away our lives for Spain? What do we care whether she is mistress of this wretched country or not? Let us resolve, brethren, to be moved neither by entreaties or threats, but to remain fast to the oath we and our Spanish comrades have sworn, that we will neither march a foot nor lift an arm until we have received our pay, and not only our pay but our share of the booty they have stolen from us the shouts of approval that greeted the speech showed that the speaker's audience was thoroughly in accord with him ned waited to hear no further orations he understood now the withdrawal of the sentries it was another of the mutinies that had so frequently broken out among the spanish forces in the netherlands making his way out through the other side of the camp he proceeded on his journey the news was important, for if the mutiny continued it would give the Prince of Orange time to prepare for the forward march of the enemy. He passed several other camps, but observed everywhere the same slackness of discipline and the absence of military precaution. All night he pushed forward without stopping, and as soon as the gates of Leiden were opened he entered. Upon inquiring he found that the prince was at Delft, and hiring a horse he at once rode there. The prince received him with real pleasure. And so you have escaped safe and sound from the siege, Master Martin. Truly your good fortune is wonderful. I am glad indeed to see you. Tell me how it goes in Harlem. Rumors reached me that there, as at other towns, they have broken their oaths and are massacring the whole population. It is not so bad as that, sir, Ned replied. They have put to death numbers of the principal citizens and all refugees they could discover in the city, but there has been no regular sack. The women have not been ill-treated, and although five executioners were kept busily at work, there has been nothing like a general massacre. Thank God for that, the prince said piously. That has eased my mind. I feared that the horrors of Zutphen and Naden had been reenacted. 
i have another piece of good news to give you sir as i passed through their camps i learned that all the troops german as well as spanish are in open mutiny and have sworn that they will neither march nor fight until they receive all arrears of pay that is good news indeed the prince exclaimed it will give us breathing time of which we are sadly in need were the spaniards to march forward now they could sweep over holland for i could not put a thousand men in the field to withstand them and now master martin what shall i do for you you have received as yet no reward whatever for the great service you rendered us by the successful carrying out of your mission to brussels to say nothing of the part you have borne in the defence of harlem i know that you joined us from pure love of our cause and hatred of spanish tyranny still that is no reason why i should not recognize your services if you would like it i would gladly appoint you to the command of a company of volunteers i thank you greatly your highness replied ned but i am far too young to command men and pray that you will allow me to remain near your person and to perform such service as you may think me capable of if that be your wish it shall be so for the present the prince replied and it is pleasant to me in these days when almost every noble in the netherlands puts a price on his services and when even the cities bargain for every crown piece they advance to find one who wants nothing but now you need rest when i am more at leisure you shall furnish me with further details of what took place inside harlem during the siege the long defence of harlem the enormous expenditure which it had cost both in money and life for no less than ten thousand soldiers had fallen in the assault or by disease induced alva to make another attempt to win back the people of holland and three days after ned's return a proclamation was sent to every town he adopted an affectionate tone ye are well aware began the address that the king has over and over again manifested his willingness to receive his children in however forlorn a condition the prodigals might return his majesty assures you once more that your sins however black they may have been shall be forgiven and forgotten in the plentitude of royal kindness if you will repent and return in season to his majesty's embrace notwithstanding your manifold crimes his majesty still seeks like a hen calling her chickens to gather you all under the parental wing this portion of the document which was by the order of the magistrates affixed to the doors of the town halls was received with shouts of laughter by the citizens and many were the jokes as to the royal hen and the return of the prodigals the conclusion of the document afforded a little further insight into the affectionate disposition of the royal bird if continued the proclamation ye disregard these offers of mercy and receive them with closed ears as heretofore then we warn you that there is no rigour or cruelty however great which you are not to expect by laying waste starvation and the sword in such manner that nowhere shall remain a relic of that which at present exists but his majesty will strip bare and utterly depopulate the land and cause it to be inhabited again by strangers since otherwise his majesty would not believe that the will of god and of his majesty had been accomplished this proclamation produced no effect whatever for the people of holland were well aware that philip of spain would never grant that religious toleration for which they were fighting and they knew also that no reliance whatever could be placed in spanish promises or oaths for a month alva was occupied in persuading the troops to return to their duty and at last managed to raise a sufficient sum of money to pay each man a portion of the arrears due to him and a few crowns on account of his share of the ransom paid by harlem during this breathing time the prince of orange was indefatigable in his efforts to raise a force capable of undertaking the relief of such towns as the spanish might invest this however he found well-nigh impossible the cities were all ready to defend themselves but in spite of the danger that threatened they were chary in the extreme in contributing money for the common cause nor would the people enlist for service in the field nothing had occurred to shake the belief in the invincibility of the spanish soldiery in fair fight in the open and the disasters which had befallen the bodies of volunteers who had endeavored to relieve harlem effectually deterred others from following their example the prince's only hope therefore of being able to put a force into the field rested upon his brother louis who was raising an army of mercenaries in germany 
he had little assurance however that relief would come from this quarter as the two armies he had himself raised in germany had effected absolutely nothing his efforts to raise a fleet were more successful the hardy mariners of zealand were ready to fight on their own element and asked nothing better than to meet the spaniards at sea nevertheless the money had to be raised for the purchase of vessels stores artillery and ammunition ned was frequently dispatched by the prince with letters to magistrates of the chief towns to nobles and men of influence and always performed his duties greatly to the prince's satisfaction as soon as the duke of alva had satisfied the troops preparations began for a renewal of hostilities and the prince soon learnt that it was intended that don frederick should invade northern holland with sixteen thousand men and that the rest of the army which had lately received further reinforcements should lay siege to leyden the prince felt confident that leyden could resist for a time but he was very anxious as to the position of things in north holland in the courage and ability of sonoy the lieutenant-governor of north holland the prince had entire confidence but it was evident by the tone of his letters that he had lost all hope of being able to defend the province and altogether despaired of the success of their cause he had written in desponding tones at the utterly insufficient means at his disposal for meeting the storm that was about to burst upon the province and had urged that unless the prince had a good prospect of help either from france or england it was better to give up the struggle than to bring utter destruction upon the whole people the letter in which the prince answered him has been preserved and well illustrates the lofty tones of his communications in this crisis of the fate of holland he reprimanded with gentle but earnest eloquence the despondency and want of faith of his lieutenant and other adherents he had not expected he said that they would have so soon forgotten their manly courage they seemed to consider the whole fate of the country attached to the city of harlem he took god to witness that he had spared no pains and would willingly have spared no drop of his blood to save that devoted city but as notwithstanding our efforts he continued it has pleased god almighty to dispose of harlem according to his divine will shall we therefore deny and deride his holy word has his church therefore come to naught you ask if i have entered into a firm treaty with any great king or potentate to which i answer that before i ever took up the cause of the oppressed christians in these provinces i had entered into a close alliance with the king of kings and i am firmly convinced that all who put their trust in him shall be saved by his almighty hand the god of armies will raise up armies for us to do battle with our enemies and his own in conclusion he detailed his preparations for attacking the enemy by sea as well as by land and encouraged his lieutenant and the population of the northern province to maintain a bold front before the advancing foe that sonoy would do his best the prince was sure but he knew how difficult it is for one who himself regards resistance as hopeless to inspire enthusiasm in others and he determined to send a message to cheer the people of north holland and urge them to resist to the last and to entrust it to one who could speak personally as to the efforts that were being made for their assistance and who was animated by a real enthusiasm in the cause it was an important mission but after considering the various persons of his household he decided to entrust it to the lad who had showed such courage and discretion in his dangerous mission to brussels a keen observer of character the prince felt that he could trust the young fellow absolutely to do his best at whatever risk to himself he had believed when he first joined him that ned was some eighteen years of age and the year that had since elapsed with its dangers and responsibilities had added two or three years to his appearance it was the fashion in holland to entirely shave the face and ned's smooth cheeks were therefore no sign of youth standing over the average height of the natives of holland with broad shoulders and well-set figure he might readily pass as a man of three or four and twenty the prince accordingly sent for the lad i have another mission for you master martin and again a dangerous one the spaniards are on the point of marching to lay siege to alkmaar and i wish a message carried to the citizens assuring them that they may rely absolutely upon my relieving them by breaking down the dikes i wish you on this occasion to be more than a messenger in these dispatches i have spoken of you as one captain martin who possesses my fullest confidence 
you would as you say be young to be a captain of a company of fighting men but as an officer attached to my household you can bear that rank as well as another it will be useful and will add to your influence and authority and i have therefore appointed you to the grade of captain of which by your conduct you have proved yourself to be worthy your mission is to encourage the inhabitants to resist to the last to rouse them to enthusiasm if you can to give them my solemn promise that they shall not be deserted and to assure them that if i cannot raise a force sufficient to relieve them i will myself come round and superintend the operation of cutting the dikes and laying the whole country under water i do not know whether you will find the lieutenant governor in the city but at any rate he will not remain there during the siege as he has work outside but i shall give you a letter recommending you to him and ask him to give you his warmest support the prince then took off the gold chain he wore round his neck and placed it upon ned i give you this in the first place captain martin in token of my esteem and of my gratitude for the perilous service you have already rendered and secondly as a visible mark of my confidence in you and as a sign that i have entrusted you with authority to speak for me going as you now do it will be best for you to assume somewhat more courtly garments in order to do credit to your mission i have given orders that these shall be prepared for you and that you shall be provided with a suit of armour such as a young noble would wear all will be prepared for you this afternoon at six o'clock a ship will be in readiness to sail and this will land you on the coast at the nearest point to alkmaar should any further point occur to you before evening speak to me freely about it ned retired depressed rather than elated at the confidence the prince reposed in him and at the rank and dignity he had bestowed upon him he questioned too whether he had not done wrong in not stating at once when the prince had on his first joining him set down his age at over eighteen that he was two years under that age and he hesitated whether he ought not even now to go to him and state the truth he would have done so had he not known how great were the labors of the prince and how incessantly he was occupied and so feared to upset his plans and cause him fresh trouble anyhow he said to himself at last i will do my best and i could do no more if i were nineteen instead of seventeen the prince has chosen me for this business not because of my age but because he thought i could carry it out and carry it out i will if it be in my power in the afternoon a clothier arrived with several suits of handsome material and make out of sober colors such as a young man of good family would wear and an armorer brought him a morion and breast and back pieces of steel handsomely inlaid with gold when he was alone he attired himself in the quietest of his new suits and looking at himself in the mirror burst into a fit of hearty laughter what in the world would my father and mother and the girls say were they to see me pranked out in such attire as this they would scarce know me and i shall scarce know myself for some time however i think i shall be able to play my part as the prince's representative better in these than i should have done in the dress i started in last time or in that i wore on board the good venture at five o'clock ned paid another visit to the prince and thanked him heartily for his kindness towards him and then received a few last instructions on his return to his room he found a corporal and four soldiers at the door the former saluted we have orders captain martin to place ourselves under your command for detached duty our kits are already on board the ship the men will carry down your mails if they are packed i only take that trunk with me ned said pointing to the one that contained his new clothes and there is besides my armor and that brace of pistols followed by the corporal and men ned now made his way down to the port where the captain of the little vessel received him with profound respect as soon as they were on board the sails were hoisted and the vessel ran down the channel from delft through the hague to the sea on the following morning they anchored soon after daybreak a boat was lowered and ned and the soldiers landed on the sandy shore followed by them he made his way over the high range of sand hills facing the sea and then across the low cultivated country extending to alkmaar he saw parties of men and women hurrying northward along the causeways laden with goods and leading in most instances horses or donkeys staggering under the weights placed upon them i think we are but just in time corporal the population of the villages are evidently fleeing before the advance of the spaniards another day and we should have been too late to get into the town 
Alkmaar had been in sight from the time they had crossed the dunes, and after walking five miles they arrived at its gates. "'Is the lieutenant governor in the town?' Ned asked one of the citizens. "'Yes, he is still here,' the man said. "'You will find him at the town hall.' There was much excitement in the streets. Armed burghers were standing in groups, women were looking anxiously from doors and casements, but Ned was surprised to see no soldiers about, although he knew that the eight hundred whom the prince had dispatched as a garrison must have arrived there some days before. On arriving at the town hall he found the general seated at table. In front of him were a group of elderly men whom he supposed to be the leading citizens, and it was evident by the raised voices and angry looks, both of the old officer and of the citizens, that there was some serious difference of opinion between them. "'Whom have we here?' Sonoy asked as Ned approached the table. "'I am a messenger, sir, from the prince. I bear these dispatches to yourself, and have also letters and messages from him to the citizens of Alkmaar.' "'You come at a good season,' the governor said shortly, taking the dispatches, "'and if anything you can say will soften the obstinacy of these good people here, you will do them and me a service.' There was silence for a few minutes as the governor read the letter Ned had brought him. "'My good friends,' he said at last to the citizens, "'this is Captain Martin, an officer whom the prince tells me stands high in his confidence. He bore part in the siege of Harlem, and has otherwise done great service to the state. The prince commends him most highly to me and to you. He has sent him here in the first place to assure you fully of the prince's intentions on your behalf.' He will especially represent the prince during the siege, and from his knowledge of the methods of defense at Harlem, of the arrangements for portioning out the food and other matters, he will be able to give you valuable advice and assistance. As you are aware, I ride in an hour to Enkhausen in order to superintend the general arrangement for the defense of the province, and especially for affording you aid, and I am glad to leave behind me an officer who is so completely in the confidence of the prince he will first deliver the messages with which he is charged to you and then we will hear what he says as to this matter which is in dispute between us the passage of ned with his escort through the street had attracted much attention and the citizens had followed him into the hall in considerable numbers to hear the message of which he was no doubt the bearer ned took his place by the side of the old officer and facing the crowd began to speak at other times he would have been diffident in addressing a crowded audience, but he felt that he must justify the confidence imposed on him, and knowing the preparations that were being made by the prince, and his intense anxiety that Alkmaar should resist to the end, he began without hesitation, and speedily forgot himself in the importance of the subject. "'Citizens of Alkmaar,' he began, "'the prince has sent me specially to tell you what there is in his mind concerning you, and how his thoughts night and day have been turned towards your city. Not only the prince, but all Holland are turning their eyes towards you, and none doubt that you will show yourselves as worthy, as faithful, and as steadfast as have the citizens of Harlem. You fight not for glory, but for your liberty, for your religion, for the honor and the lives of those dear to you, and yet your glory and your honor will be great indeed, if this little city of yours should prove the bulwark of Holland, and should beat back from its walls the power of Spain. The prince bids me tell you that he is doing all he can to collect an army and a fleet. In the latter respect he is succeeding well. The hardy seamen of Holland and Zealand are gathering round him, have sworn that they will clear the Zyder Zee of the Spaniards or die in the attempt. As to the army, it is, as you know, next to impossible to gather one capable of coping with the host of Spain in the field. But happily you need not rely solely upon an army to save you in your need. Here you have an advantage over your brethren of Harlem. There it was impossible to flood the land round the city, and the dikes by which the food supply of the Spaniards could have been cut off were too strongly guarded to be won, even when your noble governor himself led his forces against them. But it is not so here. The dikes are far away, and the Spaniards cannot protect them. Grievous as it is to the prince to contemplate the destruction of the rich country your fathers have won from the sea, he bids me tell you that he will not hesitate, but that, as a last resource, he pledges himself that he will lay the country under water and drown out the Spaniards to save you. They have sworn, as you know, to turn Holland into a desert, to leave none alive in her cities and villages. 
well then better a thousand times that we should return it to the ocean from which we won it and that then having cast off the spaniards we should renew the labors of our fathers and again recover it from the sea a shout of applause rang through the hall but this ned went on is the last resource and will not be taken until naught else can be done to save you it is for you first to show the spaniards how the men of holland can fight for their freedom their religion their families and their homes then when you have done all that men can do the prince will prove to the spaniards that the men of holland will lay their country under water rather than surrender does the prince solemnly bind himself to do this one of the elder burghers asked he does and here is his promise in black and white with his seal attached we will retire and let you have our answer in half an hour ned glanced at the governor who shook his head slightly what is there need of deliberation ned asked in a voice that was heard all over the hall to you citizens at large i appeal of what use is it now to deliberate have you not already sent a defiant answer to alva are not his troops within a day's march of you think you that even if you turn traitors to your country and to your prince and throw open the gates it would save you now did submission save narden how many of you think you would survive the sack and for those who did so what would life be worth they would live an object of reproach and scoffing among all true hollanders as the men of the city who threatened what they dared not perform who were bold while alva was four days march away but who cowered like children when they saw the standards of spain approaching their walls i appeal to you is this a time to hesitate or discuss i ask you now in the name of the prince are you true men or false are you for orange or alva what is your answer a tremendous shout shook the hall we will fight to the death no surrender down with the council and there were loud and threatening shouts against some of the magistrates the governor now rose my friends he said i rejoice to hear your decision and now there is no time for idle talk throw open the gates and call in the troops whom the prince has sent to your aid and whom your magistrates have hitherto refused to admit choose from among yourselves six men upon whom you can rely to confer with me and with the officer commanding the troops choose good and worshipful men zealous in the cause i will see before i leave to-day that your magistracy is strengthened you need now men of heart and action at your head captain martin who has been through the siege of harlem will deliberate with twelve citizens whom i will select as to the steps to be taken for gathering the food into magazines for the public use for issuing daily rations for organizing the women as well as the men for such work as they are fit there is much to be done and but little time to do it for to-morrow the spaniard will be in front of your walls in an hour's time the eight hundred troops marched in from egmont castle and egmont abbey where they had been quartered while the citizens were wavering between resistance and submission four of the citizens who had already been told off for the purpose met them at the gate and allotted them quarters in the various houses governor sonoy was already in deliberation with the six men chosen by the townspeople to represent them he had at once removed from the magistracy an equal number of those who had been the chief opponents of resistance for here as in other towns the magistrates had been appointed by the spaniards ned was busy conferring with the committee and explaining to them the organization adopted at harlem he pointed out that it was a first necessity that all the men capable of bearing arms should be divided into companies of fifty each of which should select its own captain and lieutenant that the names of the women should be inscribed with their ages that the active and able-bodied should be divided into companies for carrying materials to the walls and aiding in the defense when a breach was attacked and that the old and feeble should be made useful in the hospitals and for such other work as their powers admitted all children were to join the companies to which their mothers belonged and to help as far as they could in their work having set these matters in train ned rejoined the governor i congratulate you captain martin upon the service you have rendered to-day your youth and enthusiasm have succeeded where my experience failed you believe in the possibility of success and thus your words had a ring and fervor which were wanting in mine fearing as i do that the cause is a lost one i wondered much when you first presented yourself that the prince should have given his confidence to one so young i wonder no longer the prince never makes a mistake in his instruments and he has chosen well this time 
i leave the city to-night and shall write to the prince from ankhausen telling him how you have brought the citizens round to a sense of their duty and that whereas at the moment of your arrival i believed the magistrates would throw open the gates to-morrow i am now convinced the city will resist till the last in military matters the officer in command of the troops will of course take the direction of things but in all other matters you as the prince's special representative will act as adviser of the burghers i wish i could stay here and share in the perils of the siege it would be far more suitable to my disposition than arguing with pig-headed burghers and trying to excite their enthusiasm when my own hopes have all but vanished the officer commanding the garrison now entered and the governor introduced ned to him you will find in captain martin one who is in the prince's confidence and has been sent here as his special representative an able coadjutor he will organize the citizens as they were organized at harlem and while you are defending the walls he will see that all goes on in good order in the town that there is no undue waste in provisions that the breaches are repaired as fast as made that the sick and wounded are well cared for and that the spirits of the townspeople are maintained that will indeed be an assistance the officer said courteously these details are as necessary as the work of fighting and it is impossible for one man to attend to them and to see to his military work i shall look to you sir for your aid and assistance ned said modestly the prince is pleased to have a good opinion of me but i am young and shall find the responsibility a very heavy one and can only hope to maintain my authority by the aid of your assistance i think not that you will require much aid captain martin the governor said i marked you when you were speaking and doubt not that your spirit will carry you through all difficulties that night was a busy one in alkmaar few thought of sleeping and before morning the lists were all prepared the companies mustered officers chosen posts on the wall assigned to them and every man woman and child in alkmaar knew the nature of the duties they would be called upon to perform just before midnight the governor left farewell young man he said to ned i trust that we may meet again now that i have got rid of the black sheep amongst the magistracy i feel more hopeful as to the success of the defence but may i ask sir why you did not dismiss them before ah you hardly know the burghers of these towns sonoy said shaking his head they stand upon their rights and privileges and if you touch their civic officers they are like a swarm of angry bees governor of north holland as i am i could not have interfered with the magistracy even of this little town it was only because at the moment the people were roused to enthusiasm and because they regarded you as the special representative of the prince that i was able to do so now that the act is done they are well content with the change especially as i have appointed the men they themselves chose to the vacant places it was the same thing at ankhausen i could do nothing and it was only when sante aldegonde came with authority from the prince himself that we were able to get rid of alva's creatures well i must ride away the spaniards are encamped about six miles away and you may expect to see them soon after daybreak it was indeed early in the morning that masses of smoke were seen rising from the village of egmont telling the citizens of alkmaar that the troopers of don frederick had arrived alkmaar was but a small town and when every man capable of bearing arms was mustered they numbered only about thirteen hundred besides the eight hundred soldiers it was on the twenty first of august that don frederick with sixteen thousand veteran troops appeared before the walls of the town and at once proceeded to invest it and accomplished this so thoroughly that alva wrote it is impossible for a sparrow to enter or go out of the city there was no doubt what the fate of the inhabitants would be if the city were captured the duke was furious that what he considered his extraordinary clemency in having executed only some twenty four hundred persons at the surrender of harlem should not have been met with the gratitude it deserved if i take alkmaar he wrote to the king i am resolved not to leave a single person alive the knife shall be put to every throat since the example of harlem has proved to be of no use perhaps an example of cruelty will bring the other cities to their senses End of chapter 15
Chapter sixteen of By Pike and Dyke, a tale of the rise of the Dutch Republic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By Pike and Dyke by G. A. Henty. Chapter sixteen. Friends in Trouble. Within the little town of Alkmaar all went on quietly. While the Spaniards constructed their lines of investment and mounted their batteries, the men labored continually at strengthening their walls, the women and children carried materials, all the food was collected in magazines, and rations served out regularly. A carpenter named Peter Vandermey managed to make his way out of the city a fortnight after the investment began with letters to the prince and Sonoy, giving the formal consent of all within the walls for the cutting of the dikes when it should be necessary, for, according to the laws of Holland, a step that would lead to so enormous a destruction of property could not be undertaken, even in the most urgent circumstances, without the consent of the population. At daybreak on the 18th of September a heavy cannonade was opened against the walls, and after twelve hours' fire two breaches were made. Upon the following morning two of the best Spanish regiments, which had just arrived from Italy, led the way to the assault, shouting and cheering as they went, and confident of an easy victory. They were followed by heavy masses of troops. Now Ned was again to see what the slow and somewhat apathetic Dutch burghers could do when fairly roused to action. Every man capable of bearing a weapon was upon the walls, and not even in Harlem was an attack received with more coolness and confidence. As the storming parties approached they were swept by artillery and musketry, and as they attempted to climb the breaches, boiling water, pitch and oil, molten lead and unslaked lime were poured upon them. Hundreds of tarred and blazing hoops were skillfully thrown on to their necks, and those who in spite of these terrible missiles mounted the breach found themselves confronted by the soldiers and burghers, armed with axe and pike, and were slain or cast back again. Three times was the assault renewed, fresh troops being ever brought up and pressing forward, wild with rage at their repulses by so small a number of defenders. But each was in turn hurled back. For four hours the desperate fight continued. The women and children showed a calmness equal to that of the men, moving backwards and forwards between the magazines and the ramparts with supplies of missiles and ammunition to the combatants. At nightfall the Spaniards desisted from the attack and fell back to their camp, leaving a thousand dead behind them, while only twenty-four of the garrison and thirteen of the burghers lost their lives. A Spanish officer who had mounted the breach for an instant, and, after being hurled back, almost miraculously escaped with his life, reported that he had seen neither helmet nor harness as he looked down into the city, only some plain-looking people generally dressed like fishermen. The cannonade was renewed on the following morning, and after seven hundred shots had been fired and the breaches enlarged, a fresh assault was ordered. But the troops absolutely refused to advance. It seemed to them that the devil, whom they believed the Protestants worshipped, had protected the city. Otherwise how could a handful of townsmen and fishermen have defeated the invincible soldiers of Spain, outnumbering them eightfold? In vain Don Frederick and his generals entreated and stormed. Several of the soldiers were run through the body, but even this did not intimidate the rest into submission, and the assault was in consequence postponed. Already, indeed, there was considerable uneasiness in the Spanish camp. Governor Sonoy had opened many of the dikes, and the ground in the neighborhood of the camp was already feeling soft and boggy. It needed but that two great dikes should be pierced to spread inundation over the whole country. The carpenter who had soon after the commencement of the siege carried out the dispatches had again made his way back. He was the bearer of the copy of a letter sent from the prince to Sonoy, ordering him to protect the dikes and sluices with strong guards, lest the peasants, in order to save their crops, should repair the breaches. He was directed to flood the whole country at all risks rather than to allow Alkmaar to fall. The prince directed the citizens to kindle four great beacon fires as soon as it should prove necessary to resort to extreme measures, and solemnly promised that as soon as the signal was given, an inundation should be created which would sweep the whole Spanish army into the sea. The carpenter was informed of the exact contents of his dispatches, so that in case of losing them in his passage through the Spanish camp he could repeat them by word of mouth to the citizens. This was exactly what happened. The dispatches were concealed in a hollow stick, and this stick the carpenter, in carrying out his perilous undertaking, lost. 
as it turned out it was fortunate that he did so the stick was picked up in the camp and discovered to be hollow it was carried to don frederick who read the dispatches and at once called his officers together alarmed at the prospect before them and already heartily sick of the siege in which the honor all fell to their opponents they agreed that the safety of any army of the picked troops of spain must not be sacrificed merely with the hope of obtaining possession of an insignificant town orders were therefore given for an immediate retreat and on the eighth of october the siege was raised and the troops marched back to amsterdam thus for the first time the spaniards had to recoil before their puny adversaries the terrible loss of life entailed by the capture of harlem had struck a profound blow at the haughty confidence of the spaniards and had vastly encouraged the people of holland the successful defense of alkmaar did even more it showed the people that resistance did not necessarily lead to calamity that the risk was greater in surrender than in defiance and above all that in their dikes they possessed means of defense that if properly used would fight for them even more effectually than they could do for themselves ned had taken his full share in the labors and dangers of the siege he had been indefatigable in seeing that all the arrangements worked well and smoothly had slept on the walls with the men encouraged the women talked and laughed with the children and done all in his power to keep up the spirits of the inhabitants at the assault on the breaches he had donned his armor and fought in the front line as a volunteer under the officer in command of the garrison on the day when the spaniards were seen to be breaking up their camps and retiring a meeting was held in the town hall after a solemn thanksgiving had been offered in the church and by acclamation ned was made a citizen of the town and was presented with a gold chain as a token of the gratitude of the people of alkmaar there was nothing more for him to do here and as soon as the spaniards had broken up their camp he mounted a horse and rode to ankhausen bidding his escort follow him at once on foot he had learned from the carpenter who had made his way in that the fleet was collected and that a portion of them from the northern ports under admiral dirk zoon had already set sail and the whole were expected to arrive in a few days in the zuider zee as he rode through the street on his way to the burgomasters his eye fell upon a familiar face and he at once reined in his horse ah peters he exclaimed is it you is the good venture in port peters looked up in astonishment the voice was that of ned martin but he scarce recognized in the handsomely dressed young officer the lad he had last seen a year before why it is master ned sure enough he exclaimed shaking the lad's hand warmly though if you had not spoken i should have assuredly passed you why lad you are transformed i took you for a young noble with your brave attire and your gold chain and you look years older than when i last saw you you have grown into a man but though you have added to your height and your breadth your cheeks have fallen in greatly and your colour has well nigh faded away i have had two long bouts of fasting peters and have but just finished the second i am captain martin now by the favour of the prince of orange how are they at home and how goes it with my father he is on board master ned this is his first voyage and right glad we are as you may guess to have him back again and joyful will he be to see you he had your letter safely that you wrote after the fall of harlem and it would have done you good if you had heard the cheers in the summer-house when he read it out to the captains there we had scarce thought we should ever hear of you again i will put up my horse at the burgomaster's peters and come on board with you at once i must speak to him first for a few minutes a messenger was sent off on horseback last night the moment the road was opened to say that the spaniards had raised the siege of alkmaar but i must give him a few details so you have been there too the guns have been firing and the bells ringing all the day and the people have been well nigh out of their minds with joy they had looked to the spaniards coming here after they had finished with alkmaar and you may guess how joyful they were when the news came that the villains were going off beaten a quarter of an hour later ned leapt from the quay on to the deck of the good venture his father's delight was great as he entered the cabin and he was no less astonished than peters had been at the change that a year had made in his appearance why ned he said after they had talked for half an hour i fear you are getting much too great a man ever to settle down again to work here 
not at all father ned laughed i have not the least idea of remaining permanently here i love the sea and i love england and my home and nothing would tempt me to give them up i cannot leave my present work now the prince has been so kind to me that even if i wished it i could not withdraw from his service now but i do not wish in another year if all the dutch cities prove as staunch as harlem and alkmaar have done the spaniards will surely begin to see that their task of subduing such a people is a hopeless one at any rate i think that i can then very well withdraw myself from the work and follow my profession again i shall be old enough then to be your second mate and to relieve you of much of your work i shall be glad to have you with me captain martin said of course i still have the supercargo but that is not like going ashore and seeing people one's self however we can go on as we are for a bit you have been striking a blow for freedom lad i mean to do my best to strike one tomorrow or next day how is that father bossu's fleet of thirty vessels are cruising off the town and they have already had some skirmishes with dirk zoon's vessels but nothing much has come of it yet the spaniards although their ships are much larger and heavily armed and more numerous too than ours do not seem to have any fancy for coming to close quarters but there is sure to be a fight in a few days there is a vessel in port which will go out crowded with the fishermen here to take part in the fight and i am going to fly the dutch flag for once instead of the english and am going to strike a blow to pay them off for the murder of your mother's relations to say nothing of this and he touched his wooden leg there are plenty of men here ready and willing to go and i have taken down the names of eighty who will sail with us so we shall have a strong crew and shall be able to give a good account of ourselves can i go with you father ned asked eagerly if you like lad it will be tough work you know for the spaniards fight well that cannot be denied but as you stood against them when they have been five to one in the breaches of harlem and alkmaar to say nothing of our skirmish with them you will find it a novelty to meet them when the odds are not altogether against us the next day the eleventh of october the patriot fleet were seen bearing down with a strong easterly breeze upon the spaniards who were cruising between Ankhausen and horn all was ready on board the good venture and her consort the bells rang and a swarm of hardy fishermen came pouring on board in five minutes the sails were hoisted and the two vessels flying the dutch flag started amidst the cheers of the burghers on the walls to take their share in the engagement they came up with the enemy just as Dirk Zoon's vessels engaged them, and at once joined in the fray. The Patriot fleet now numbered twenty-five vessels against the thirty Spaniards, most of which were greatly superior in size to their opponents. The Dutch at once maneuvered to come to close quarters, and the Spaniards, who had far less confidence in themselves by sea than on land, very speedily began to draw out of the fight the good venture and a dutch craft had laid themselves alongside a large spanish ship and boarded her from both sides ned and peters followed by the english sailors clambered on board near the stern while the dutch fishermen most of whom were armed with heavy axes boarded at the waist the spaniards fought but feebly and no sooner did the men from the craft on the other side pour in and board her than they threw down their arms four other ships were taken and the rest of the spanish vessels spread their sails and made for amsterdam hotly pursued by the dutch fleet one huge spanish vessel alone the inquisition a name that was in itself an insult to the dutch and which was by far the largest and best manned vessel in the two fleets disdained to fly she was the admiral's vessel and bossu who was himself a native of the netherlands although deserted by his fleet refused to fly before his puny opponents the spaniards in the ships captured had all been killed or fastened below and under charge of small parties of the dutch sailors the prizes sailed for ankhausen the ship captured by the good venture had been the last to strike her flag and when she started under her prize crew there were three smaller dutch ships besides the good venture on the scene of the late conflict with a cheer answered from boat to boat the four vessels sailed towards the inquisition a well-directed broadside from the spaniards cut away the masts out of one of them and left her in a sinking condition the other three got alongside and grappled with her so high did she tower above them that her cannon were of no avail to her now and locked closely together the sailors and soldiers fought as if on land it was a life-and-death contest bossu and his men clad in coats of mail stood with sword and shield on the deck of the inquisition to repel all attempts to board 
the dutch attacked with their favorite missiles pitched hoops boiling oil and molten lead again and again they clambered up the lofty sides of the inquisition and gained a momentary footing on her deck only to be hurled down again into their ships below the fight began at three o'clock in the afternoon and lasted till darkness but even this did not terminate it and all night spaniards and dutchmen grappled in deadly conflict all this time the vessels were drifting as the winds and tide took them and at last grounded on a shoal called the neck near wideness just as morning was breaking john herring of horn the man who had kept a thousand at bay on the dimar dyke and who now commanded one of the vessels gained a footing on the deck of the inquisition unnoticed by the spaniards and hauled down her colors but a moment later he fell dead shot through the body as soon as it was light the country people came off in boats and joined in the fight relieving their compatriots by carrying their killed and wounded on shore they brought fresh ammunition as well as men and at eleven o'clock admiral bossu seeing that further resistance was useless and that his ship was aground on a hostile shore his fleet dispersed and three-quarters of his soldiers and crew dead or disabled struck his flag and surrendered with three hundred prisoners he was landed at horn and his captors had great difficulty in preventing him from being torn to pieces by the populace in return for the treacherous massacre at rotterdam of which he had been the author during the long fight ned martin behaved with great bravery again and again he and peters had led the boarders and it was only his morion and breastpiece that had saved him many times from death he had been wounded several times, and was so breathless and hurt by his falls from the deck, that at the end he could no longer even attempt to climb the sides of the Spanish vessel. Captain Martin was able to take no part in the melee. He had at the beginning of the fight taken up his post on the taffrail, and seated there, had kept up a steady fire with a musket against the Spaniards as they showed themselves above. As soon as the fight was over, the good venture sailed back to Enkhausen five of her own crew and thirty-eight of the volunteers on board her had been killed and there was scarcely a man who was not more or less severely wounded the english were received with tremendous acclamation by the citizens on their arrival in port and a vote of thanks was passed to them at a meeting of the burghers in the town hall ned sailed round in the good venture to delft and again joined the prince of orange there and was greatly commended for his conduct at alkmaar which had been reported upon in the most favorable terms by sonoy on learning the share that the good venture had taken in the sea fight the prince went on board and warmly thanked captain martin and the crew and distributed a handsome present among the latter half an hour after the prince returned to the palace he sent for ned did you not say he asked that the lady who concealed you at brussels was the countess von harp yes your highness you have no bad news of her i hope i am sorry to say that i have the prince replied i have just received a letter brought me by a messenger from a friend at maastricht he tells me among other matters that the countess and her daughter were arrested there two days since they were passing through in disguise and were it was supposed making for germany when it chanced that the countess was recognized by a man in the service of one of the magistrates it seems he had been born on von harp's estate and knew the countess well by sight he at once denounced her and she and her daughter and a woman they had with them were thrown into prison i am truly sorry for the count was a great friend of mine and i met his young wife many times in the happy days before these troubles began ned was greatly grieved when he heard of the danger to which the lady who had behaved so kindly to him was exposed and an hour later he again went into the prince's study i have come in to ask sir if you will allow me to be absent for a time certainly captain martin the prince replied are you thinking of paying a visit to england no sir i am going to try if i can do anything to get the countess von harp out of the hands of those who have captured her but how are you going to do that the prince asked in surprise it is one thing to slip out of the hands of alva's minions as you did at brussels but another thing altogether to get two women out of prison that is so ned said but i rely much sir upon the document which i took a year since from the body of von art's clerk and which i have carefully preserved ever since it bears the seal of the blood council and is an order to all magistrates to assist the bearer in all ways that he may require with the aid of that document i may succeed in unlocking the doors of the prison it is a bold enterprise 
the prince said and may cost you your life still i do not say it is impossible i have also ned said some orders for the arrest of prisoners these are not sealed but bear the signature of the president of the council i shall go to a scrivener and shall get him to copy one of them exactly making only the alteration that the persons of the countess von harp her daughter and servant are to be handed over to my charge for conveyance to brussels alone this document might be suspected but fortified as i am by the other with the seal of the council it may pass without much notice yes but you would be liable to detection by any one who has known this man chenet there is a certain risk of that ned replied and if any one who knew him well met me i should of course be detected but that is unlikely the man was about my height although somewhat thinner his principal mark was a most evil squint that he had and that any one who had once met him would be sure to remember i must practice crossing my eyes in the same manner when i present my papers the prince smiled sometimes you seem to me a man martin and then again you enter upon an undertaking with the light-heartedness of a boy however far be it from me to hinder your making the attempt it is pleasant though rare to see people mindful of benefits bestowed upon them and one is glad to see that gratitude is not altogether a lost virtue go my lad and may god aid you in your scheme i will myself send for a scrivener at once and give him instructions it may well be that he would refuse to draw up such a document as you require merely on your order leave the order for arrest with me and i will bid him get a facsimile made in all respects you will require two or three trusty men with you to act as officials under your charge i will give you a letter to my correspondent in maastricht begging him to provide some men on whom he can rely for this work it would be difficult for you a stranger in the town to put your hand upon them the next morning ned provided with the forged order of release started on his journey he was disguised as a peasant and carried a suit of clothes similar in cut and fashion to those worn by genet he went first to rotterdam and bearing west crossed the river lek and then struck the vaal at gorakin and there hired a boat and proceeded up the river to nimogen he then walked across to grave and again taking boat proceeded up the maas past venlo and roermond to maastricht he landed a few miles above the town and changed his peasant clothes for the suit he carried with him at a farmhouse he succeeded in buying a horse saddle and bridle the animal was but a poor one but it was sufficiently good for his purpose as he wanted it not for speed but only to enable him to enter the city on horseback maastricht was a strongly fortified city and on entering its gates ned was requested to show his papers he at once produced the document bearing the seal of the council this was amply sufficient and he soon took up his quarters at an inn his first step was to find the person for whom he bore the letter from the prince the gentleman who was a wealthy merchant after reading the missive and learning from ned the manner in which he could assist him at once promised to do so you require three men you say dressed as officials in the employment of the council the dress is easy enough for they bear no special badge or cognizance although generally they are attired in dark green doublets and trunks and red hose there will be no difficulty as to the men themselves the majority of the townsmen are warmly affected to the patriotic cause and there are many who are at heart protestants though like myself obliged to abstain from making open confession of their faith at any rate i have three men at least upon whom i can absolutely rely their duty you say will be simply to accompany you to the prison and to ride with these ladies until beyond the gates they must of course be mounted and must each have pillions for the carriage of the prisoners behind them once well away from the town they will scatter leave their horses at places i shall appoint change their clothes and return into the city what do you mean to do with the ladies when you have got them free i do not know what their plans will be or where they will wish to go ned said i should propose to have a vehicle with a pair of horses awaiting them two miles outside the town i should say that a country cart would be least likely to excite suspicion i would have three peasants dresses there with it i do not know that i can make further provision for their flight as i cannot say whether they will make for the coast or try to continue their journey across the frontier you can leave these matters to me the merchant said the cart and disguises shall be at the appointed spot whenever you let me know the hour at which you will be there you must give me until noon to-morrow to make all the arrangements 
very well sir ned said i am greatly obliged to you and the prince who is a personal friend of the countess will i am sure be greatly pleased when he hears how warmly you have entered into the plans for aiding her escape i will present myself to the magistrates to-morrow at noon and obtain from them the order upon the governor of the prison to hand the ladies over to me if i should succeed i will go straight back to my inn if you will place someone near the door there to see if i enter which if i succeed will be at about one o'clock he can bring you the news i will have my horse brought round at two and at that hour your men can ride up and join me and i will proceed with them straight to the prison End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of by pike and dyke a tale of the rise of the dutch republic this librivox recording is in the public domain by pike and dyke by g a henty chapter seventeen a rescue at twelve o'clock on the following day ned went to the town hall and on stating that he was the bearer of an order from the council was at once shown into the chamber in which three of the magistrates were sitting i am the bearer of an order from the council for the delivery to me of the persons of the countess von harp her daughter and the woman arrested in company with them for conveyance to brussels there to answer the charges against them this is the order of the council with their seal ordering all magistrates to render assistance to me as one of their servants this is the special order for the handing over to me of the prisoners named the magistrates took the first order glanced at it and at the seal and perfectly satisfied with this gave a casual glance at that for the transferring of the prisoners i think you were about a year since with councillor von art one of the magistrates said ned bowed by the way did i not hear that you were missing or that some misfortune had befallen you some months since i have a vague recollection of doing so yes i was sorely maltreated by a band of robber peasants who left me for dead but as you see i am now completely recovered i suppose you have some men with you to escort the prisoners one of the magistrates asked assuredly ned replied i have with me three men behind whom the women will ride the magistrates countersigned the order upon the governor of the prison to hand over the three prisoners and gave it with the letter of the council to ned he bowed and retired i should not have remembered him again the magistrate who had been the chief speaker said after he had left the room had it not been for that villainous cast in his eyes i remember noticing it when he was here last time and wondered that von art should like to have a man whose eyes were so crossways about him otherwise i do not recall the face at all which is not surprising seeing that i only saw him for a minute or two and noticed nothing but that abominable squint of his ned walked back to his inn ordered his horse to be saddled at two o'clock and partook of a hearty meal then paying his reckoning he went out and mounted his horse as he did so three men in green doublets and red hose rode up and took their places behind him on arriving at the prison he dismounted and handing his horse to one of his followers entered i have an order from the council countersigned by the magistrates here for the delivery to me of three prisoners the warder showed him into a room the governor is ill he said and confined to his bed but i will take the order to him ned was pleased with the news for he thought it likely that genet might have been there before on similar errands and his person be known to the governor in ten minutes the warder returned the prisoners are without he said and ready to depart pulling his bonnet well down over his eyes ned went out into the courtyard you are to accompany me to brussels countess he said gruffly horses are waiting for you without the countess did not even glance at the official who had thus come to convey her to what was in all probability death but followed through the gate into the street the men backed their horses up to the block of stone used for mounting ned assisted the females to the pillions and when they were seated mounted his own horse and led the way down the street many of the people as they passed along groaned or hooted for the feeling in maastricht was strongly in favor of the patriot side a feeling for which they were some years later to be punished by almost total destruction of the city and the slaughter of the greater portion of its inhabitants ned paid no attention to these demonstrations but quickening his horse into a trot rode along the street and out of the gate of the city 
as the road was a frequented one he maintained his place at the head of the party until they had left the city nearly two miles behind them on arriving at a small crossroad one of the men said this is the way sir it is up this road that the cart is waiting ned now reined back his horse to the side of that on which the countess was riding countess he said have you forgotten the english lad you aided a year ago in brussels the countess started i recognize you now sir she said coldly and little did i think at that time that i should next see you as an officer of the council of blood ned smiled your mistake is a natural one countess but in point of fact i am still in the service of the prince of orange and have only assumed this garb as a means of getting you and your daughter out of the hands of those murderers i am happy to say that you are free to go where you will these good fellows are like myself disguised and are at your service in a few minutes we shall come to a cart which will take you wheresoever you like to go and there are disguises similar to those with which you once fitted me out in readiness for you there the surprise of the countess for a moment kept her silent, but Gertrude, who had overheard what was said, burst into exclamations of delight. "'Pardon me for having doubted you,' the countess exclaimed, much affected. "'No pardon is required, countess. Seeing that the prison authorities handed you over to me, you could not but have supposed that I was, as I seemed, in the service of the council.' just at this moment they came upon a cart drawn up by the roadside ned assisted the countess and her daughter to alight and while he was rendering similar assistance to the old servant mother and daughter threw themselves into each other's arms and wept with delight at this unexpected delivery that had befallen them it was some time before they were sufficiently recovered to speak but how do you come here the countess asked ned and how have you effected this miracle ned briefly related how he had heard of their captivity and the manner in which he had been enabled to effect their escape and now countess he said the day is wearing on and it is necessary that you should at once decide upon your plans will you again try to make to the german frontier or to the sea coast or remain in hiding here we cannot make for germany without again crossing the mars the countess said and it is a long way to the sea coast what say you magdalen i think the old woman said that you had best carry out the advice i gave you before it is a little more than twelve miles from here to the village where as i told you i have relations living we can hire a house there and there is no chance of your being recognized i can send a boy thence to brussels to fetch the jewels and money you left in charge of your friend the count von dort there that will certainly be the best way magdalen we can wait there until either there is some change in the state of affairs or until we can find some safe way of escape it is fortunate indeed that i left my jewels in brussels instead of taking them with me as i had at first intended it will hardly be necessary will it she asked ned to put on the disguises for nothing in the world can be simpler than our dresses at present you had certainly best put the peasant cloaks and caps on inquiries are sure to be made all through the country when they find at maastricht how they have been tricked three peasant women in a cart will attract no attention whatever even in passing through villages but dressed as you are now some one might notice you and recall it if inquiries were made the three men who had aided in the scheme had ridden off as soon as the cart was reached and ned being anxious that the party should be upon their way and desirous too of avoiding the expressions of gratitude of the three women hurried them into the cart it was not necessary for them to change their garments as the peasants cloaks completely enveloped them and the high head-dresses quite changed their appearance do not forget countess i hope some day to see you in england ned said as they took their seats i will not forget the countess said and only wish that at present i was on my way thither after a warm farewell and seeing the cart fairly on its way ned mounted his horse and rode northwest he slept that night at hirenthals and on the following night at bois le duc here he sold his horse for a few crowns and taking boat proceeded down the dommel into the maas and then on to rotterdam on his arrival at delft he was heartily welcomed by the prince who was greatly pleased to hear that he had without any accident or hitch carried out successfully the plan he had proposed to himself three weeks later the prince heard from his correspondent at maastricht the letter was cautiously worded as were all those interchanged lest it should fall into the hands of the spanish 
there has been some excitement here a week since a messenger arrived from brussels with orders that three female prisoners confined here should be sent at once to brussels but curiously enough it was found that the three prisoners in question had been handed over upon the receipt of a previous order this is now pronounced to be a forgery and it is evident that the authorities have been tricked there has been much search and inquiry but no clue whatever has been obtained as to the direction taken by the fugitives or concerning those engaged in this impudent adventure alva's reign of terror and cruelty was now drawing to an end his successor was on his way out and the last days of his administration were embittered by his failure of his plans the retreat of his army from before alkmaar and the naval defeat from the zuider zee but he continued his cruelties to the end massacres on a grand scale were soon carried on and a nobleman named ertenhove who had been taken prisoner was condemned to be roasted to death before a slow fire and was accordingly fastened by a chain to a stake around which a huge fire was kindled he suffered in slow torture a long time until dispatched by the executioner with a spear a piece of humanity that greatly angered the duke alva had contracted an enormous amount of debt both public and private in amsterdam and now caused a proclamation to be issued that all persons having demands upon him were to present their claims on a certain day on the previous night he and his train noiselessly took their departure the heavy debts remained unpaid and many opulent families were reduced to beggary such was the result of the confidence of the people of amsterdam in the honor of their tyrant on the seventeenth of november don louis de requesin grand commander of st iago alva's successor arrived in brussels and on the eighteenth of december the duke of alva left he is said to have boasted on his way home that he had caused eighteen thousand inhabitants of the provinces to be executed during the period of his government this was however a mere nothing to the number who had perished in battle siege starvation and massacre after the departure of their tyrant the people of the netherlands breathed more freely for they hoped that under their new governor there would be a remission in the terrible agony they had suffered and for a time his proclamations were of a conciliatory nature but it was soon seen that there was no change in policy peace was to be given only on the condition of all protestants recanting or leaving their country the first military effort of the new governor was to endeavor to relieve the city of middelburg the capital of the island of valkeren which had long been besieged by the protestants mondragon the governor was sorely pressed by famine and could hold out but little longer unless rescue came the importance of the city was felt by both parties requisen himself went up to bergen op zoom where seventy-five ships were collected under the command nominally of admiral de Glein but really under that of julian romero while another fleet of thirty ships was assembled at antwerp under de avila and moved down towards flushing there to await the arrival of that of romero upon the other hand the prince of orange collected a powerful fleet under the command of admiral boisseau and himself paid a visit to the ships and assembling the officers roused them to enthusiasm by a stirring address on the twentieth of january the good venture again entered the port of delft and hearing that a battle was expected in a few days captain martin determined to take part in it as soon as he had unloaded his cargo he called the crew together and informed them of his determination but said that as this was no quarrel of theirs any who chose could remain on shore until his return but englishmen felt that the cause of holland was their own and not a single man on board availed himself of this permission ned informed the prince of orange of his father's intention and asked leave to accompany him assuredly you may go if you please the prince said but i fear that sooner or later the fortune of war will deprive me of you and i should miss you much moreover almost every sailor in port is already in one or other of Wasso's ships and i fear that with your weak crew you would have little chance if engaged with one of these spanish ships full of men we have enough to work our cannon sir ned said besides i think we may be able to beat up some volunteers there are many english ships in port waiting for cargoes which come in but slowly and i doubt not that some of them will gladly strike a blow against the spaniards 
ned and peters accordingly went round among the english vessels and in the course of two hours had collected a hundred volunteers in those days every englishman regarded a spaniard as a natural enemy drake and hawkins and other valiant captains were warring fiercely against them in the indian seas and officers and men in the ships in delft were alike eager to join in the forthcoming struggle against them the good venture had flying the dutch flag joined boisseau's fleet at romersweil a few miles below bergen on the twenty seventh of january and when the hollanders became aware of the nationality of the vessel which had just joined them they welcomed them with tremendous cheers two days later the fleet of romero were seen coming down the river in three divisions when the first of the spanish ships came near they delivered a broadside which did considerable execution among the dutch fleet there was no time for further cannonading a few minutes later the fleets met in the narrow channel and the ships grappling with each other a hand-to-hand -hand struggle began the fighting was of the most desperate character no quarter was asked or given on either side and men fought with fury hand to hand upon decks slippery with blood but the combat did not last long the spaniards had little confidence in themselves on board ship their discipline was now of little advantage to them and the savage fury with which the zealanders fought shook their courage fifteen ships were speedily captured and twelve hundred spaniards slain and the remainder of the fleet which on account of the narrowness of the passage had not been able to come into action retreated to bergen romero himself whose ship had grounded sprang out of a porthole and swam ashore and landed at the very feet of the grand commander who had been standing all day upon the dike in the midst of a pouring rain only to be a witness of the total defeat of his fleet mondragon now capitulated receiving honorable conditions the troops were allowed to leave the place with their arms ammunition and personal property and mondragon engaged himself to procure the release of santa alagonde and four other prisoners of rank or to return and give himself up as a prisoner of war requisin however neither granted the release of the prisoners nor permitted mondragon to return it was well for these prisoners that bossu was in the hands of the prince had it not been for this they would have all been put to death with the fall of middleburg the dutch and zealanders remained masters of the entire line of sea-coast but on land the situation was still perilous leyden was closely invested and all communications by land between the various cities suspended the sole hope that remained was in the army raised by count louis he had raised three thousand cavalry and six thousand infantry and accompanied by the prince's other two brothers crossed the rhine in a snowstorm and marched towards maastricht the prince of orange had on his part with the greatest difficulty raised six thousand infantry and wrote to count louis to move to join him in the isle of bommel after he had reduced maastricht but the expedition like those before it was destined to failure a thousand men deserted seven hundred more were killed in a night surprise and the rest were mutinous for their pay finally count louis found himself confronted by a force somewhat inferior in numbers to his own but the spanish infantry were well disciplined and obedient those of louis were mercenaries and discontented and although at first his cavalry gained an advantage it was a short one and after a fierce action his army was entirely defeated count louis finding that the day was lost gathered a little band of troopers and with his brother count henry and christopher son of the elector palatine charged into the midst of the enemy they were never heard of more the battle terminated in a horrible butchery at least four thousand men were either killed in the field suffocated in the marshes drowned in the river or burned in the farmhouses in which they had taken refuge count louis and his brother and friend probably fell on the field but stripped of their clothing disfigured by wounds and the trampling of horses their bodies were never recognized the defeat of the army and the death of his two brave brothers was a terrible blow to the prince of orange he was indeed paying dear for his devotion to his country his splendid fortune had been entirely spent his life had been one of incessant toil and anxiety his life had been several times threatened with assassination he had seen his every plan thwarted save on the sandy slip of coast by the ocean the whole of the netherlands was still prostrate beneath the foot of the spaniard and now he had lost two of his brothers 
england and france had alternately encouraged and stood aloof from him and after all these efforts and sacrifices the prospects of ultimate success were gloomy in the extreme fortunately the spaniards were not able to take full advantage of their victory over the army of count louis they differed from the german mercenaries inasmuch as that while the latter mutinied before they fought the spaniards fought first and mutinied afterwards having won a great battle they now proceeded to defy their generals three years pay were due to them and they took the steps that they had always adopted upon these occasions a commander called the eletto was chosen by acclamation a board of councillors was appointed to assist and control him while the councillors were narrowly watched by the soldiers they crossed the maas and marched to antwerp the grand commander hastened there to meet them and when they arrived in perfect military order he appeared before them on horseback and made them an oration promising that their demands should be satisfied the soldiers simply replied we want money not words requisan consulted the city council and demanded four hundred thousand crowns to satisfy the troops the citizens hesitated at providing so enormous an amount knowing by past experience that it would never be repaid the soldiers however employed their usual methods they quartered themselves upon the houses of the citizens and insisted upon being supplied with rich food wine and luxuries of all kinds and in a week or two the burghers saw that they must either pay or be ruined an offer was accordingly made of ten months arrears in cash five months in silks and woolen cloths and the rest in promises to be fulfilled within a few days the eletto declared that he considered the terms satisfactory whereupon the troops at once deposed him and elected another carousing and merry-making went on at the expense of the citizens and after suffering for some weeks from the extortions and annoyance of the soldiers the four hundred thousand crowns demanded by requisen were paid over and the soldiers received all their pay due either in money or goods a great banquet was held by the whole mass of soldiery and there was a scene of furious revelry the soldiers arrayed themselves in costumes cut from the materials they had just received broadcloths silks satins and gold embroidered brocades were hung in fantastic drapery over their ragged garments and when the banquet was finished gambling began but when they were in the midst of their revelry the sound of cannon was heard boisseau had sailed up the skelt to attack the fleet of the avila which had hastened up to antwerp for refuge after the defeat of romero there was a short and sharp action and fourteen of the spanish ships were burnt or sunk the soldiers swarmed down to the dike and opened a fire of musketry upon the dutch they were however too far off to effect any damage and boisseau with a few parting broadsides sailed triumphantly down the river having again struck a heavy blow at the naval power of spain the siege of leyden had been raised when count louis crossed the rhine the troops being called in from all parts to oppose his progress the prince of orange urged upon the citizens to lose no time in preparing themselves for a second siege to strengthen their walls and above all to lay in stores of provisions but as ever the dutch burghers although ready to fight and to suffer when the pinch came were slow and apathetic unless in the face of necessity and in spite of the orders and entreaties of the prince nothing whatever was done and the spaniards when they returned before the city on the twenty sixth of may after two months absence found the town as unprepared for resistance as it had been at their first coming and that the citizens had not even taken the trouble to destroy the forts that they had raised round it leyden stood in the midst of broad and fruitful pastures reclaimed from the sea around were numerous villages with blooming gardens and rich orchards innumerable canals cut up the country and entering the city formed its streets these canals were shaded with trees crossed by a hundred and forty-five bridges upon an artificial elevation in the centre of the city rose a ruined tower of great antiquity assigned either to the saxons before they crossed to england or with greater probability to the romans the force which now appeared before the town consisted of eight thousand walloons and germans commanded by valdez they lost no time in taking possession of the hague and all the villages and forts round leyden five hundred english volunteers under command of colonel chester abandoned the fort of valkenburg which had been entrusted to them and fled towards leyden 
not as yet had the english soldiers learnt to stand before the spaniards but the time was ere long to come when having acquired confidence in themselves they were to prove themselves more than a match for the veterans of spain the people of leyden refused to open their gates to the fugitives and they surrendered to valdez as at that moment a mission was on the point of starting from Requesens to Queen Elizabeth, the lives of the prisoners were spared, and they were sent back to England. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of By Pike and Dyke, A Tale of the Rise of the Dutch Republic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By Pike and Dyke by G. A. Henty Chapter 18. The Siege of Leiden The Spaniards had no sooner appeared before Leiden than they set to work to surround it with a cordon of redoubts. No less than sixty-two, including those left standing since the last siege, were erected and garrisoned, and the town was therefore cut off from all communication from without. Its defenders were few in number, there being no troops in the town save a small corps composed of exiles from other cities, and five companies of the burgher guard. The walls, however, were strong, and it was famine rather than the foe that the citizens feared. They trusted to the courage of the burghers to hold the walls, and to the energy of the Prince of Orange to relieve them. The prince, although justly irritated by their folly in neglecting to carry out his orders, sent a message by a pigeon to them, encouraging them to hold out, and reminding them that the fate of their country depended upon the issue of this siege. He implored them to hold out for at least three months, assuring them that he would within that time devise means for their deliverance. The citizens replied, assuring the prince of their firm confidence in their own fortitude and his exertions on the sixth of june the grand commander issued what was called a pardon signed and sealed by the king in it he invited all his erring and repentant subjects to return to his arms and accept a full forgiveness for their past offence upon the sole condition that they should once more enter the catholic church a few individuals mentioned by name were alone excluded from this amnesty but all holland was now protestant and its inhabitants were resolved that they must not only be conquered but annihilated before the roman church should be re-established on their soil in the whole province but two men came forward to take advantage of the amnesty many netherlanders belonging to the king's party sent letters from the camp to their acquaintances in the city exhorting them to submission and imploring them to take pity upon their poor old fathers their daughters and their wives but the citizens of Leiden thought the best they could do for these relatives was to keep them out of the clutches of the Spaniards. At the commencement of the siege the citizens gathered all their food into the magazines, and at the end of June the daily allowance to each full-grown man was half a pound of meat and half a pound of bread, women and children receiving less. The prince had his headquarters at Delft and Rotterdam, and an important fortress called the Poldervaart between these two cities secured him the control of the district watered by the rivers Isel and Maas. On the 29th of June the Spaniards attacked this fort, but were beaten off with a loss of 700 men. The prince was now occupied in endeavouring to persuade the Dutch authorities to permit the great sluices at Rotterdam, Schiedam, and Delft Haven to be opened. The damage to the country would be enormous, but there was no other course to rescue Leiden, and with it the whole of Holland, from destruction. It was not until the middle of July that his eloquent appeals and arguments prevailed, and the estates consented to his plan. Subscriptions were opened in all the Dutch towns for maintaining the inhabitants of the district that was to be submerged until it could be again restored, and a large sum was raised, the women contributing their plate and jewellery to the furtherance of the scheme. On the 3rd of August all was ready, and the prince himself superintended the breaking down of the dikes in sixteen places, while at the same time the sluices at Schiedam and Rotterdam were opened, and the water began to pour over the land. While waiting for the water to rise, stores of provisions were collected in all the principal towns, and two hundred vessels of small draught of water gathered in readiness. Unfortunately, no sooner had the work been done than the prince was attacked by a violent fever, brought on by anxiety and exertion. On the 21st of August a letter was received from the town saying that they had now fulfilled their original promise, for they had held out two months without food and another month without food. 
their bread had long been gone and their last food some malt cake would last but four days after that was gone there was nothing left but starvation upon the same day they received a letter from the prince assuring them that the dikes were all pierced and the water rising upon the great dike that separated the city from the sea the letter was read publicly in the market-place and excited the liveliest joy among the inhabitants bands of music played in the streets and salvos of cannon were fired the spaniards became uneasy at seeing the country beyond them gradually becoming covered with water and consulted the country people and the royalists in their camp all of whom assured them that the enterprise of the prince was an impossibility and that the water would never reach the walls the hopes of the besieged fell again however as day after day passed without change and it was not until the first of september when the prince began to recover from his fever and was personally able to superintend the operations that these began in earnest the distance from leyden to the outer dyke was fifteen miles ten of these were already flooded and the flotilla which consisted of more than two hundred vessels manned in all with twenty five hundred veterans including eight hundred of the wild sea beggars of zealand renowned as much for their ferocity as for nautical skill started on their way and reached without difficulty the great dyke called the land skiding between this town and leyden were several other dykes all of which would have to be taken all these besides the sixty-two forts were defended by the spanish troops four times the number of the relieving force ned had been in close attendance upon the prince during his illness and when the fleet was ready to start requested that he might be allowed to accompany it this the prince at once granted and introduced him to admiral boisseau i shall be glad if you will take captain martin in your own ship he said young as he is he has seen much service and is full of resource and invention you will i am sure find him of use and he can act as messenger to convey your orders from ship to ship the prince had given orders that the land skiding whose top was still a foot and a half above water should be taken possession of at all hazard and this was accomplished by surprise on the night of the tenth the spaniards stationed there were either killed or driven off and the dutch fortified themselves upon it at daybreak the spaniards stationed in two large villages close by advanced to recover the important position but the dutch fighting desperately drove them back with the loss of some hundreds of men the dyke was at once cut through and the fleet sailed through the gap the admiral had believed that the land skiding once cut the water would flood the country as far as leyden but another dyke the greenway rose a foot above water three quarters of a mile inside the land skiding as soon as the water had risen over the land sufficiently to float the ships the fleet advanced seized the greenway and cut it but as the water extended in all directions it grew also shallower and the admiral found that the only way by which he could advance was by a deep canal leading to a large mere called the freshwater lake this canal was crossed by a bridge and its sides were occupied by three thousand spanish soldiers boisseau endeavored to force the way but found it impossible to do so and was obliged to withdraw he was now almost despairing he had accomplished but two miles the water was sinking rather than rising owing to a long continued east wind and many of his ships were already aground on the eighteenth however the wind shifted to the northwest and for three days blew a gale the water rose rapidly and at the end of the second day the ships were all afloat again hearing from a peasant of a comparatively low dyke between two villages boisseau at once sailed in that direction there was a strong spanish force stationed here but these were seized with a panic and fled their courage unhinged by the constantly rising waters the appearance of the numerous fleet and their knowledge of the reckless daring of the wild sailors the dyke was cut the two villages with their fortifications burned and the fleet moved on to north Au the enemy abandoned this position also and fled to zutermir a strongly fortified village a mile and a quarter from the city walls gradually the spanish army had been concentrated round the city as water drove them back and they were principally stationed at this village and the two strong forts of lamen and leiderdorp each within a few hundred yards of the town at the last named post valdez had his headquarters and colonel borgia commanded at lamen 
the fleet was delayed at north Owl by another dyke called the kirkway the waters too spreading again over a wider space and diminished from the east wind again setting in sank rapidly and very soon the whole fleet was aground for there were but nine inches of water and they required twenty to float them day after day they lay motionless the prince of orange who had again been laid up with the fever rose from his sick-bed and visited the fleet he encouraged the dispirited sailors rebuked their impatience and after reconnoitering the ground issued orders for immediate destruction of the kirkway and then returned to delft all this time leyden was suffering horribly the burghers were aware that the fleet had set forth to their relief but they knew better than those on board the obstacles that opposed its progress the flames of the burning villages and the sound of artillery told them of its progress until it reached north Owl. then there was a long silence and hope almost deserted them they knew well that so long as the east wind continued to blow there could be no rise in the level of the water and anxiously they looked from the walls and the old tower for signs of a change they were literally starving and their misery far exceeded even that of the citizens of harlem a small number of cows only remained and of these few were killed every day and tiny morsels of meat distributed the hides and bones being chopped up and boiled the green leaves were stripped from the trees and every herb gathered and eaten the mortality was frightful and whole families died together in their houses from famine and plague for pestilence had now broken out and from six to eight thousand people died from this alone leyden abandoned all hope and yet they spurned the repeated summonses of valdez to surrender they were fully resolved to die rather than to yield to the spaniards from time to time however murmurs arose among the suffering people and the heroic burgomaster adrian van der werf was at once surrounded by a crowd and assailed by reproaches he took off his hat and calmly replied to them i tell you i have made an oath to hold the city and may god give me strength to keep it i can die but once either by your hands the enemies or by the hand of god my own fate is indifferent to me not so that of the city entrusted to my care i know that we shall all starve if not soon relieved but starvation is preferable to the dishonored death which is the only alternative your menaces move me not my life is at your disposal here is my sword plunge it into my breast and divide my flesh among you take my body to appease your hunger but expect no surrender so long as i remain alive still the east wind continued until stout admiral boisseau himself almost despaired but on the night of the first of october a violent gale burst from the northwest and then shifting blew more strongly from the southwest the water was piled up high upon the southern coast of holland and sweeping furiously inland poured through the ruined dikes and in twenty-four hours the fleet was afloat again at midnight they advanced in the midst of the storm and darkness some spanish vessels that had been brought up to aid the defenders were swept aside and sunk the fleet sweeping on past half-submerged stacks and farmhouses made its way to the freshwater mere some shallows checked it for a time but the crews sprang overboard into the water and by main strength hoisted their vessels across them two obstacles alone stood between them and the city the forts of Zuterwald and Lammen, the one five hundred and the other but two hundred and fifty yards from the city. Both were strong and well supplied with troops and artillery, but the panic which had seized the Spaniards extended to Zuterwald. Hardly was the fleet in sight in the gray light of the morning when the Spaniards poured out from the fortress and spread along a road on the dike leading in a westerly direction towards the Hague the waves driven by the wind were beating on the dike and it was crumbling rapidly away and hundreds sank beneath the flood the zealanders drove their vessels up alongside and pierced them with their harpoons or plunging into the waves attacked them with sword and dagger the numbers killed amounted to not less than a thousand the rest effected their escape to the hague zuterwald was captured and set on fire but lamon still barred their path bristling with guns it seemed to defy them either to capture or pass it on their way to the city leiderdorp where valdez and his main force lay was a mile and a half distant on the right and within a mile of the city and the guns of the two forts seemed to render it next to impossible for the fleet to pass on 
Boisseau, after reconnoitering the position, wrote despondently to the prince that he intended, if possible, on the following morning, to carry the fort, but if unable to do so, he said, there would be nothing for it but to wait for another gale of wind to still further raise the water, and enable him to make a wide circuit and enter Leiden on the opposite side. A pigeon had been dispatched by Boisseau in the morning informing the citizens of his exact position, and at nightfall the burgomaster and a number of citizens gathered at the watchtower. Yonder, cried the magistrate, pointing to Lamont, behind that fort are bread and meat and brethren in thousands. Shall all this be destroyed by Spanish guns, or shall we rush to the aid of our friends? we will tear the fortress first to fragments with our teeth and nails was the reply and it was resolved that a sortie should be made against lamon at daybreak when boisseau attacked it on the other side a pitch-dark night set in a night full of anxiety to the spaniards to the fleet and to leyden the sentries on the walls saw lights flitting across the waters and in the dead of night the whole of the city wall between two of the gates fell with a loud crash the citizens armed themselves and rushed to the breach, believing that the Spaniards were on them at last, but no foe made his appearance. In the morning the fleet prepared for the assault. All was still and quiet in the fortress, and the dreadful suspicion that the city had been carried at night, and that all their labor was in vain, seized those on board. Suddenly a man was seen wading out from the fort, while at the same time a boy waved his cap wildly from its summit. The mystery was solved. The Spaniards had fled panic-stricken in the darkness. Had they remained they could have frustrated the enterprise, and Leiden must have fallen. But the events of the two preceding days had shaken their courage. Valdez retired from Leiderdorp and ordered Colonel Borgia to evacuate Lamon. Thus they had retreated at the very moment that the fall of the wall sapped by the flood laid bare a whole side of the city for their entrance. They heard the crash in the darkness, and it but added to their fears, for they thought that the citizens were sallying out to take some measures which would further add to the height of the flood. Their retreat was discovered by the boy, who, having noticed the procession of lights in the darkness, became convinced that the Spaniards had retired, and persuaded the magistrates to allow him to make his way out to the fort to reconnoiter. As soon as the truth was known the fleet advanced, passed the fort, and drew up alongside the quays. These were lined by the famishing people, every man, woman, and child having strength to stand having come out to greet their deliverers. Bread was thrown from all the vessels among the crowd as they came up, and many died from too eagerly devouring the food after their long fast. Then the admiral stepped ashore, followed by the whole of those on board the ships. Magistrates and citizens, sailors and soldiers, women and children, all repaired to the great church and returned thanks to God for the deliverance of the city. The work of distributing food and relieving the sick was then undertaken. The next day the prince, in defiance of the urgent entreaties of his friends, who were afraid of the effects of the pestilential air of the city, upon his constitution enfeebled by sickness, repaired to the town. Shortly afterwards, with the advice of the states, he granted the city as a reward for its suffering a ten days' annual fare, without tolls or taxes, and it was further resolved that a university should, as a manifestation of the gratitude of the people of Holland, be established within its walls. The fiction of the authority of Philip was still maintained, and the charter granted to the university was, under the circumstances, a wonderful production. It was drawn up in the name of the king, and he was gravely made to establish the university as a reward to Leiden for rebellion against himself. Considering, it said, that during these present wearisome wars within our provinces of Holland and Zealand, all good instruction of youth in the sciences and literary arts is likely to come into entire oblivion, considering the difference of religion, considering that we are inclined to gratify our city of Leiden with its burghers on account of the heavy burden sustained by them during this war with such faithfulness, we have resolved, after ripely deliberating with our dear cousin William Prince of Orange, Stadtholder, to erect a free public school and university, etc. So ran the document establishing this famous university, all needful regulations for its government being entrusted by Philip to his above-mentioned dear cousin of Orange. 
ned martin was not one of those who entered leyden with boisseau's relieving fleet his long watching and anxiety by the bedside of the prince had told upon him and he felt strangely unlike himself when he started with the fleet so long as it was fighting its way forward the excitement kept him up but the long delay near the village of au and the deep despondency caused by the probable failure of their hopes of rescuing the starving city again brought on an attack of the fever that had already seized him before starting and when the prince of orange paid his visit to the fleet boisseau told him the young officer he had recommended to him was down with fever which was he believed similar to that from which the prince himself was but just recovering the prince at once ordered him to be carried on board his own galley and took him with him back to delft here he lay for a month completely prostrated the prince several times visited him personally and as soon as he became in some degree convalescent said to him i think we have taxed you too severely and have worked you in proportion to your zeal rather than to your strength the surgeon says that you must have rest for a while and that it will be well for you to get away from our marshes for a time for two years you have done good and faithful service and even had it not been for this fever you would have a right to rest and i think that your native air is best for you at present with the letters that came to me from flushing this morning is one from your good father asking for news of you his ship arrived there yesterday and he has heard from one of those who were with boisseau that you have fallen ill therefore if it be to your liking i will send you in one of my galleys to flushing i thank your excellency much ned said indeed for the last few days i have been thinking much of home and longing to be back i fear that i shall be a long time before i shall be fit for hard work again here you will feel a different man when you have been a few hours at sea the prince said kindly i hope to see you with me again some day there are many of your countrymen who like yourself have volunteered in our ranks and served us well without pay or reward but none of them have rendered better service than you have done and now farewell i will order a galley to be got in readiness at once i leave myself for leyden in half an hour take this my young friend in remembrance of the prince of orange and i trust that you may live to hand it down to your descendants as a proof that i appreciated your good services on behalf of a people struggling to be free so saying he took off his watch and laid it on the table by ned's bedside pressed the lad's hand and retired he felt it really a sacrifice to allow this young englishman to depart he had for years been a lonely man with few confidants and no domestic pleasures he lived in an atmosphere of trouble doubt and suspicion he had struggled alone against the might of philip the apathy of the western provinces the coldness and often treachery of the nobles the jealousies and niggardliness of the estates representing cities each of which thought rather of itself and its privileges than of the general good and the company of this young englishman with his frank utterances his readiness to work at all times and his freedom from all ambitions or self-interested designs had been a pleasure and relief to him and he frequently talked to him far more freely than even to his most trusted counsellors ever since the relief of alkmaar ned had been constantly with him save when dispatched on missions to various towns or to see that the naval preparations were being pushed on with all speed and his illness had made a real blank in his little circle however the doctors had spoken strongly as to the necessity for ned's getting away from the damp atmosphere of the half-submerged land and he at once decided to send him back to england and seized the opportunity directly the receipt of captain martin's letter informed him that the ship was at flushing an hour later four men entered with a litter the servants had already packed ned's mails and he was carried down and placed on board one of the prince's vessels they rowed down into the maas and then hoisting sail proceeded down the river kept outside the island to valkyrin and then up the estuary of the skelt to flushing it was early morning when they arrived in port ned was carried upon deck and soon made out the good venture lying a quarter of a mile away he was at once placed in the boat and rowed alongside an exclamation from peters as he looked over the side and saw ned lying in the stern of the boat called captain martin out from his cabin why ned my dear boy he exclaimed as he looked over the side you seem in grievous state indeed 
there is not much the matter with me father i have had fever but am getting over it and it will need but a day or two at sea to put me on my feet again i have done with the war at present and the prince has been good enough to send me in one of his own galleys to you we will soon get you round again never fear master ned peters said as he jumped down into the boat to aid in hoisting him on board no wonder the damp airs of this country have got into your bones at last i never can keep myself warm when we are once in these canals if it wasn't for their skeedom i don't believe the dutchmen could stand it themselves ned was soon lifted on board and carried into the cabin aft the good venture had already discharged her cargo and as there was no chance of filling up again at flushing sail was made an hour after he was on board and the vessel put out to sea it was now early in november but although the air was cold the day was fine and bright and as soon as the vessel was under way ned was wrapped in cloaks and laid on a mattress on deck with his head well propped up with pillows one seems to breathe in fresh life here father he said it is pleasant to feel the motion and the shock of the waves after being so long on land i feel stronger already while so long as i was at delft i did not seem to gain from one day to the other i hope we shan't make too rapid a voyage i don't want to come home as an invalid we shall not make a fast run of it unless the wind changes ned it blows steadily from the west at present and we shall be lucky if we cast anchor under a week in the pool all the better father in a week i shall be on my legs again unless i am greatly mistaken ned's convalescence was indeed rapid and by the time they entered the mouth of the thames he was able to walk from side to side of the vessel and as the wind still held from the west it was another four days before they dropped anchor near london bridge ned would have gone ashore in his old attire but upon putting it on the first day he was able to get about he found he had so completely outgrown it that he was obliged to return to the garments he had worn in holland he was now more than eighteen years of age and nearly six feet in height he had broadened out greatly and the position he had for the last year held as an officer charged with authority by the prince had given him a manner of decision and authority altogether beyond his years as he could not wear his sailor dress he chose one of the handsomest of those he possessed it consisted of maroon doublet and trunks slashed with white with a short mantle of dark green and hose of the same color his cap was maroon in color with small white and orange plumes and he wore a ruff round his neck captain martin saluted him with a bow of reverence as he came on deck why ned they will think that i am bringing a court gallant with me your mother and the girls will be quite abashed at all this finery i felt strange in it myself at first ned laughed but of course i am accustomed to it now the prince is not one who cares for state himself but as one of his officers i was obliged to be well dressed and indeed this dress and the others i wear were made by his orders and presented to me indeed i think i am very moderate in not decking myself out with the two gold chains i have the one a present from his highness the other from the city of alkmaar to say nothing of the watch set with jewels that the prince gave me on leaving Ned's mother and the girls were on the lookout, for the good venture had been noticed as she passed. Ned had at his father's suggestion kept below in order that he might give them a surprise on his arrival. "'I verily believe they won't know you,' he said as they approached the gate. "'You have grown four inches since they saw you last, and your cheeks are thin and pale instead of being round and sunburnt. This, with your attire, has made such a difference that I am sure any one would pass you in the street without knowing you.' ned hung a little behind while his mother and the girls met his father at the gate as soon as the embraces were over captain martin turned to ned and said to his wife my dear i have to introduce an officer of the prince who has come over for his health to stay a while with us this is captain martin dame martin gave a start of astonishment looked incredulously for a moment at ned and then with a cry of delight threw herself into his arms it really seems impossible that this can be ned she said as after kissing his sisters he turned to her why husband it is a man and a very fine one too wife he tops me by two inches and as to his attire i feel that we must all smarten up to be fit companions to such a splendid bird why the girls look quite awed by him but you look terribly pale ned and thin his mother said and you were so healthy and strong i shall soon be healthy and strong again mother 
when i have got out of these fine clothes which i only put on because i could not get into my old ones and you have fed me up for a week on good english beef you will see that there is no such great change in me after all and now let us go inside captain martin said there is a surprise for you there ned entered and was indeed surprised at seeing his aunt elizabeth sitting by the fire while his cousins were engaged upon their needlework at the window they too looked for a moment doubtful as he entered for the fifteen months since they had last seen him when he left them at the surrender of harlem had changed him much and his dress at that time had been very different to that he now wore it was not until he exclaimed well aunt this is indeed a surprise that they were sure of his identity and they welcomed him with a warmth scarcely less than his mother and sisters had shown elizabeth plomart was not of a demonstrative nature but although she had said little at the time she had felt deeply the care and devotion which ned had exhibited to her and her daughters during the siege and knew that had it not been for the supplies of food scanty as they were that he nightly brought in she herself and probably the girls would have succumbed to hunger when did you arrive aunt ned asked when the greetings were over four months ago ned life was intolerable in harlem owing to the brutal conduct of the spanish soldiers i was a long time bringing myself to move had it not been for the girls i should never have done so but things became intolerable and when most of the troops were removed at the time count louis advanced we managed to leave the town and make our way north it was a terrible journey to ankhausen but we accomplished it and after being there a fortnight took passage in a ship for england and as you see here we are End of chapter eighteen Chapter nineteen of By Pike and Dyke A Tale of the Rise of the Dutch Republic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By Pike and Dyke by G. A. Henty. Chapter nineteen The Queen's Service. A few days after Ned's return home his aunt and cousins moved into a house close by, which they had taken a short time before. Dame Plomart's half of the property, purchased with the money that had been transmitted by her father-in-law and his sons to England, being ample to keep them in considerable comfort. Just as Ned was leaving Delft some dispatches had been placed in his hands for delivery upon his arrival in London to Lord Walsingham. The great minister was in attendance upon the Queen at Greenwich, and thither Ned proceeded by boat on the morning after his arrival. On stating that he was the bearer of dispatches from the Prince of Orange, Ned at once obtained an audience, and bowing deeply presented his letters to the Queen's counsellor. The latter opened the letter addressed to himself, and after reading a few words, said, be seated captain martin the prince tells me that he sends it by your hand but that as you are prostrate by fever you will be unable to deliver it personally i am glad to see that you are so far recovered ned seated himself while lord walsingham continued the perusal of his dispatches the prince is pleased to speak in very high terms of you captain martin he said and tells me that as you are entirely in his confidence you will be able to give me much information besides that that he is able to write he then proceeded to question ned at length as to the state of feeling in holland its resources and means of resistance upon all of which points ned replied fully the interview lasted near two hours at the end of which time lord walsingham said when i hand the letter enclosed within my own to the queen i shall report to her majesty very favorably as to your intelligence and it may possibly be that she may desire to speak to you herself for she is deeply interested in this matter and although circumstances have prevented her showing that warmth for the welfare of holland that she feels she has no less the interest of that country at heart and will be well pleased to find that one of her subjects has been rendering such assistance as the prince is pleased to acknowledge in his letter to me please therefore to leave your address with my secretary in the next room in order that i may communicate with you if necessary two days later one of the royal servants brought a message that captain martin was to present himself on the following day at greenwich as her majesty would be pleased to grant him an audience knowing that the queen loved that those around her should be bravely attired ned dressed himself in the suit that he had only worn once or twice when he had attended the prince to meetings of the estates 
it was of a puce-colored satin slashed with green with a short mantle of the same material with the cape embroidered in silver the bonnet was to match with a small white feather he placed the chain the prince had given him round his neck and with an ample ruff and manchets of flemish lace and his rapier by his side he took his place in the boat and was rowed to greenwich he felt some trepidation as he was ushered in a page conducted him to the end of the chamber where the queen was standing with lord walsingham at her side ned bowed profoundly the queen held out her hand and bending on one knee ned reverently placed it to his lips i am gratified captain martin she said at the manner in which my good cousin the prince of orange has been pleased to speak of your services to him you are young indeed sir to have passed through such perilous adventures and i would fain hear from your lips the account of the deliverance of leyden and of such other matters as you have taken part in the queen then seated herself and ned related modestly the events at leyden harlem alkmaar and the two sea fights in which he had taken part the queen several times questioned him closely as to the various details we are much interested she said in these fights in which the burghers of holland have supported themselves against the soldiers of spain seeing that we may ourselves some day have to maintain ourselves against that power how comes it young sir that you came to mix yourself up in these matters we know that many of our subjects have crossed the water to fight against the spaniards but these are for the most part restless spirits who are attracted as much perhaps by a love of adventure as by their sympathy with the people of the netherlands ned then related the massacre of his dutch relations by the spaniards and how his father had lost a leg while sailing out of antwerp i remember me now the queen said the matter was laid before our council and we remonstrated with the spanish ambassador and he in turn accused our seamen of having first sunk a spanish galley without cause or reason and when not employed in these dangerous enterprises of which you have been speaking do you say that you have been in attendance upon the prince himself he speaks in his letter to my lord walsingham of his great confidence in you how came you first a stranger and a foreigner to gain the confidence of so wise and prudent a prince he entrusted a mission to me of some slight peril your majesty and i was fortunate enough to carry it out to his satisfaction tell me more of it the queen said it may be that we ourselves shall find some employment for you and i wish to know upon what grounds we should place confidence in you tell me fully the affair i am not pressed for time and love to listen to tales of adventure ned thus commanded related in full the story of his mission to brussels truly the prince's confidence was well reposed in you she said when ned had finished you shall hear from us anon captain martin since you know holland so well and are high in the confidence of the prince we shall doubtless be able to find means of utilizing your services for the benefit of the realm so saying she again extended her hand to ned who after kissing it retired from the audience chamber delighted with the kindness and condescension of elizabeth when he had left the queen said to lord walsingham a very proper young officer lord walsingham and one of parts and intelligence as well as of bravery methinks we may find him useful in our communications with the prince of orange and from his knowledge of the people we may get surer intelligence from him of the state of feeling there with regard to the alliance they are proposing with us and to their offers to come under our protection than we can from our own envoy it is advisable too at times to have two mouthpieces the one to speak in the public ear the other to deliver our private sentiments and plans he is young for so great a responsibility lord walsingham said hesitatingly if the prince of orange did not find him too young to act in matters in which the slightest indiscretion might bring a score of heads to the block i think that we can trust him my lord in some respects his youth will be a distinct advantage did we send a personage of age and rank to holland it might be suspected that he had a special mission from us and our envoy might complain that we were treating behind his back but a young officer like this could come and go without attracting observation and without even philip's spies suspecting that he was dabbling in affairs of state at this time indeed the queen was as she had long been playing a double game with the netherlands holland and zealand were begging the prince to assume absolute power the prince of orange who had no ambition whatever for himself was endeavouring to negotiate with either england or france to take the estates under their protection 
elizabeth while jealous of france was unwilling to incur the expenditure in men and still more money that would be necessary were she to assume protection of holland as its sovereign under the title offered to her of countess of holland and yet though unwilling to do this herself she was still more unwilling to see france step in and occupy the position offered to her while above all she shrank from engaging at present in a life and death struggle with spain thus while ever assuring the prince of orange of her good will she abstained from rendering any absolute assistance although continuing to hold out hopes that she would later on accept the sovereignty offered for the next three weeks ned remained quietly at home the gatherings in the summer-house were more largely attended than ever and the old sailors were never tired of hearing from ned stories of the sieges in holland it was a continual source of wonder to them how will martin's son who had seemed to them a boy like other boys should have gone through such perilous adventures should have had the honor of being in the prince of orange's confidence and the still greater honor of being received by the queen and allowed to kiss her hand it was little more than two years back that ned had been a boy among them never venturing to give his opinion unless first addressed and now he was a young man with a quiet and assured manner and bearing himself rather as a young noble of the court than the son of a sea captain like themselves it was all very wonderful and scarce seemed to them natural especially as ned was as quiet and unaffected as he had been as a boy and gave himself no airs whatever on the strength of the good fortune that had befallen him much of his time was spent in assisting his aunt to get her new house in order and in aiding her to move into it this had just been accomplished when he received an order to go down to greenwich and call upon lord walsingham he received from him dispatches to be delivered to the prince of orange together with many verbal directions for the prince's private ear he was charged to ascertain as far as possible the prince's inclinations towards a french alliance and what ground he had for encouragement from the french king upon your return captain martin you will render me an account of all expenses you have borne and they will of course be defrayed my expenses will be but small my lord ned replied for it chances that my father's ship sails to-morrow for rotterdam and i shall take passage in her while there i am sure that the prince whose hospitality is boundless will insist upon my staying with him as his guest and indeed it seems to me that this would be best so for having so long been a member of his household it will seem to all that i have but returned to resume my former position the public service in the days of queen elizabeth was not sought for by men for the sake of gain it was considered the highest honor to serve the queen and those employed on embassies missions and even in military commands spent large sums and sometimes almost beggared themselves in order to keep up a dignity worthy of their position considering themselves amply repaid for any sacrifices by receiving an expression of the royal approval ned martin therefore returned home greatly elated at the honorable mission that had been entrusted to him his father however although also gratified at ned's reception at court and employment in the queen's service looked at it from the matter-of-fact point of view it is all very well ned he said as they were talking the matter over in family conclave in the evening and i do not deny that i share in the satisfaction that all these women are expressing it is a high honor that you should be employed on a mission for her majesty and there are scores of young nobles who would be delighted to be employed in such service but you see ned you are not a young noble and although honor is a fine thing it will buy neither bread nor cheese if you were the heir to great estates you would naturally rejoice in rendering services which might bring you into favor at court and win for you honor and public standing but you see you are the son of a master mariner happily the owner of his own ship and of other properties which are sufficient to keep him in comfort but which will naturally at the death of your mother and myself go to the girls while you will have the good venture and my share in other vessels but these are businesses that want looking after and the income would go but a little way to support you in a position at court you have now been two years away from the sea that matters little but if you were to continue in the royal service for a time you would surely become unfitted to return to the rough life of a master mariner fair words butter no parsnip ned honor and royal service empty the purse instead of filling it it behooves you to think these matters over i am surprised at you will dame martin said i should have thought that you would have been proud of the credit and honor that ned is winning why all our neighbors are talking of nothing else 
all our neighbors will not be called upon wife to pay for master ned's support to provide him with courtly garments and enable him to maintain a position which will do credit to his royal mistress i am proud of ned as proud as any one can be but that is no reason why i should be willing to see him spend his life as a needy hanger-on of the court rather than as a british sailor bearing a good name in the city and earning a fair living by honest trade ned knows that i am speaking only for his own good court favor is but an empty thing and our good queen is fickle in her likings and has never any hesitation in disavowing the proceedings of her envoys when a man has broad lands to fall back upon he can risk the loss of court favor and can go into retirement assured that sooner or later he will again have his turn but such is not ned's position i say not that i wish him at once to draw back from this course but i would have him soberly think it over and judge whether it is one that in the long run is likely to prove successful mrs martin her sister-in-law and the four girls looked anxiously at ned they had all since the day that he was first sent for to greenwich been in a high state of delight at the honor that had befallen him and his father's words had fallen like a douche of cold water upon their aspirations i fully recognize the truth of what you say father he said after a pause and i will think it deeply over which i shall have time to do before my return from holland assuredly it is not a matter to be lightly decided it may mean that this royal service may lead to some position of profit as well as honor although now as you have put it to me i own that the prospect seems to me to be a slight one and that where so many are ready to serve for honor alone the chance of employment for one requiring money as well as honor is but small however there can be no need for instant decision i am so fond of the sea that i am sure that even if away from it for two or three years i should be ready and willing to return to it i am as yet but little over eighteen and even if i remained in the royal service until twenty-one i should still have lost but little of my life and should not be too old to take to the sea again in time i shall see more plainly what the views of lord walsingham are concerning me and whether there is a prospect of advancement in the service he will know that i cannot afford to give my life to the queen's service without pay not being as you say a noble or a great landowner that is very well spoken ned his father said there is no need in any way for you to come to any resolution on the subject at present i shall be well content to wait until you come of age as you say by that time you will see whether this is but a brief wind of royal favor or whether my lord walsingham designs to continue you in the royal service and to advance your fortunes i find that i am able to get on board a ship better than i had expected and have no wish to retire from the sea at present therefore there will be plenty of time for you to decide when you get to the age of one and twenty nevertheless this talk will not have been without advantage for it will be far better for you not to have set your mind altogether upon court service and you will then if you finally decide to return to the sea not have to suffer such disappointment as you would do had you regarded it as a fixed thing that some great fortune was coming to you so let it be an understood thing that this matter remains entirely open until you come to the age of twenty-one ned accordingly went backwards and forwards to holland for the next two years bearing letters and messages between the queen and the prince of orange there was some pause in military operations after the relief of leyden negotiations had for a long time gone on between the king of spain acting by royal commissioners on the one side and the prince and the estates on the other the royal commissioners were willing in his name to make considerable concessions to withdraw the spanish troops from the country and to permit the estates general to assemble but as they persisted that all heretics should either recant or leave the provinces no possible agreement could be arrived at as the question of religion was at the bottom of the whole movement during the year fifteen seventy five the only military operation of importance was the recovery by the spaniards of the island of scalvin which with its chief town zierigzi was recovered by a most daring feat of arms the spaniards wading for miles through water up to the neck on a wild and stormy night and making their way across in spite of the efforts of the zealanders in their ships Zirikzi indeed resisted for many months, and finally surrendered only to hunger, the garrison obtaining good terms from the Spaniards, who were so anxious for its possession that to obtain it they were even willing for once to forego their vengeance for the long resistance it had offered. 
In March 1576, while the siege was still going on, Requisen died suddenly of a violent fever, brought on partly by anxiety caused by another mutiny of the troops. This mutiny more than counterbalanced the advantage gained by the capture of the island of Scalvin, for after taking possession of it, the soldiers engaged in the service at once joined the mutiny and marched away into Brabant. The position of Holland had gone from bad to worse. The utmost efforts of the population were needed to repair the broken dikes and again recover the submerged lands. So bare was the country of animals of all kinds, that it had become necessary to pass a law forbidding for a considerable period the slaughter of oxen, cows, calves, sheep, or poultry. Holland and Zeeland had now united in a confederacy, of which the prince was at the head, and by an act of union in June 1575 the two little republics became virtually one. Among the powers and duties granted to the prince he was to maintain the practice of the reformed evangelical religion, and to cause to cease the exercise of all other religions contrary to the gospel. He was, however, not to permit that inquisition should be made into any man's belief or conscience, or that any man by cause thereof should suffer trouble, injury, or hindrance. Upon one point only the prince had been peremptory, he would have no persecution. In the original terms he had been requested to suppress the Catholic religion, but had altered the words into religion at variance with the gospel. Almost alone, at a time when every one was intolerant, the Prince of Orange was firmly resolved that all men should have liberty of conscience. Holland suffered a great loss when Admiral Boisseau fell in endeavoring to relieve Zierich Zee. The harbor had been surrounded by Spaniards, by a submerged dike of piles of rubbish. Against this Boisseau drove his ship, which was the largest of his fleet. He did not succeed in breaking through. The tide ebbed and left his ship aground, while the other vessels were beaten back. Rather than fall into the hands of the enemy, he and three hundred of his companions sprang overboard and endeavored to effect their escape by swimming, but darkness came on before he could be picked up, and he perished by drowning. The mutiny among the Spanish regiments spread rapidly, and the greater part of the German troops of Spain took part in it. The mutineers held the various citadels throughout the country and ravaged the towns, villages, and open country. The condition of the people of Brabant was worse than ever. Despair led them to turn again to the provinces which had so long resisted the authority of Spain, and the fifteen other states, at the invitation of the prince, sent deputies to Ghent to a general congress to arrange for a close union between the whole of the provinces of the Netherlands. Risings took place in all parts of the country, but they were always repressed by the Spaniards, who, though in open mutiny against their king and officers, had no idea of permitting the people of the Netherlands to recover the liberty that had at the cost of so much blood been wrung from them. Maastricht drove out its garrison, but the Spaniards advanced against the town, seized a vast number of women, and placing these before them advanced to the assault. The citizens dared not fire, as many of their own wives or sisters were among the women. The town was therefore taken, and a hideous massacre followed. Ned Martin had now been two years engaged upon various missions to Holland, and Lord Walsingham himself acknowledged to his mistress that her choice of the young officer had been a singularly good one. He had conducted himself with great discretion, his reports were full and minute, and he had several times had audiences with the Queen, and had personally related to her matters of importance concerning the state of Holland, and the views of the Prince and the Estates General. The Congress at Ghent, and the agitation throughout the whole of the Netherlands, had created a lively interest in England, and Ned received orders to visit Ghent and Antwerp, and to ascertain more surely the probability of an organization of the provinces into a general confederation. When he reached Ghent he found that the attention of the citizens was for the time chiefly occupied with the siege of the citadel, which was held by a Spanish garrison, and he therefore proceeded to Antwerp. This was at the time probably the wealthiest city in Europe. It carried on the largest commerce in the world, its warehouses were full of the treasures of all countries, its merchants vied with princes in splendor. The proud city was dominated, however, by its citadel, which had been erected not for the purpose of external defense, but to overawe the town. The governor of the garrison, Diavola, had been all along recognized as one of the leaders of the mutiny. The town itself was garrisoned by Germans who still held aloof from the mutiny, but who had been tampered with by him. 
the governor of the city champagny although a sincere catholic hated the spaniards and had entered into negotiations with the prince the citizens thought at present but little of the common cause their thoughts being absorbed by fears of their own safety threatened by the mutinous spanish troops who had already captured and sacked alost and were now assembling with the evident intention of gathering for themselves the rich booty contained within the walls of antwerp as they approached the town a force of five thousand walloon infantry and twelve hundred cavalry were dispatched from brussels to the aid of its sister city no sooner however did this force enter the town than it broke into a mutiny which was only repressed with the greatest difficulty by champagny it was at this moment that ned entered the city he at once communicated with the governor and delivered to him some messages with which he had been charged by the prince of orange whom he had visited on his way had you arrived three days since i could have discussed these matters with you the governor said but as it is we are hourly expecting attack and can think of nothing but preparations for defence i shall be glad if you can assist me in that direction half the german garrison are traitors the walloons who have just entered are in no way to be relied upon and it is the burghers themselves upon whom the defence of the town must really fall they are now engaged in raising a rampart facing the citadel i am at once proceeding thither to superintend the work ned accompanied the governor to the spot and found twelve thousand men and women laboring earnestly to erect a rampart constructed of bales of goods casks of earth upturned wagons and other bulky objects the guns of the fortress opened upon the workers and so impeded them that night fell before the fortifications were nearly completed unfortunately it was bright moonlight and the artillerymen continued their fire with such accuracy that the work was at last abandoned and the citizens retired to their homes champagny did all that was possible aided by some burghers and his own servants he planted what few cannon there were at the weakest points but his general directions were all neglected and not even scouts were posted in the morning a heavy mist hung over the city and concealed the arrival of the spanish troops from all the towns and fortresses in the neighborhood as soon as it was fairly daylight the defenders mustered the marquis of havre claimed for the walloons the post of honor in defense of the lines facing the citadel and six thousand men were disposed here while the bulk of the german garrison were stationed in the principal squares at ten o'clock the mutineers from alost marched into the citadel raising the force there to five thousand veteran infantry and six hundred cavalry ned had been all night at work assisting the governor he had now laid aside his ordinary attire and was clad in complete armor he was not there to fight but there was clearly nothing else to do unless indeed he made his escape at once to the fleet of the prince of orange which was lying in the river this he did not like doing until it was clear that all was lost he had seen the dutch burghers beat back the most desperate assaults of the spanish troops and assuredly the walloons and germans who without counting the burghers considerably exceeded the force of the enemy ought to be able to do the same just before daybreak he made his way down to the quays ascertained the exact position of the fleet and determined how he had best get on board he chose a small boat from among those lying at the quay and removed it to the foot of some stairs by a bridge he fastened the head rope to a ring and pushed the boat off so that it lay under the bridge concealed from the sight of any who might pass along the wharves having thus prepared for his own safety he was making his way to rejoin the governor when a woman came out from a house in a quiet street as she met him he started why magdalen he exclaimed is it you what are you doing in antwerp is the countess here the woman looked at him in surprise don't you remember me magdalen the boy you dressed up as a girl in brussels and whom you last saw at maastricht bless me the old servant exclaimed is it you sir i should never have known you again three years make a great deal of difference ned laughed and it is more than that now since we last met please to come in sir the countess will be right glad to see you and so will miss gertrude they have talked of you hundreds of times and wondered what had become of you she opened the door again with the great key and led the way into the house mistress she said showing the way into the parlor here is a visitor for you the countess and her daughter had like every one else in antwerp been up all night and rose from her seat by the fire as the young officer entered he took off his helmet and bowed deeply what is your business with me the countess asked seeing that he did not speak i have not come exactly upon business countess he replied but to thank you for past kindnesses 
mother it is the english boy exclaimed the young lady sitting upon the side of the fire rising from her seat surely sir you are master edward martin your eyes are not in fault fraulein i am edward martin i am glad indeed to see you sir the countess said how often my daughter and i have longed for the time when we might again meet you to tell how grateful we are for the service you did us i wonder now that i did not recognize you but you have changed from a lad into a man you must remember it is more than four years since we were together at brussels as for the meeting near maastricht it was such a short one and i was so full of joy at the thought that gertrude and i had escaped the fearful danger hanging over us that i scarce noticed your appearance nor had we any time to talk then we received the letter you wrote after leaving us at brussels from the hague telling us that you had arrived there safely but since you did us that service at maastricht we have never heard of you i had not your address ned replied and even had i known where you were i should not have dared to write for there was no saying into whose hands the letter might not fall but countess excuse me if i turn to other matters for the time presses sorely you know that the city will be attacked to-day so every one says the countess replied but surely you do not think that there is any danger the walloons and germans should be able alone to hold the barricades and behind them are all the citizens i put little faith in the walloons ned said shortly and some of the germans we know have been bribed i would rather that all were out of the way and that it were left to the burghers alone to defend the barricades i have seen how the citizens of the netherlands can fight at harlem and alkmaar as for these walloons i have no faith in them i fear countess that the danger is great and if the spaniards succeed in winning their way into the town there is no mercy to be expected for man woman or child i consider that it would be madness for you to stay here but what are we to do sir the countess asked the only way madam is to make your way on board the prince's fleet i am known to many of the officers and can place you on board at once if you wait until the spaniards enter it will be too late there will be a wild rush to the river and the boats will be swamped if the attack fails and the spaniards retire from before the city you can if you choose return to shore though i should say that even then it will be better by far to go to rotterdam or delft unless you decide to do as you once talked about to find a refuge for a time in england i will accept your offer gladly sir the countess said i have long been looking for some way to leave the city but none can go on board the ships without a pass and i have not dared to ask for one not for worlds would i expose my daughter to the horrors of a sack can we go at once yes madam i have everything in readiness and would advise no delay i have nothing that i need mind leaving behind i am as you see more comfortable here than i was at brussels but i am still forced to keep my concealment in five minutes we shall be ready End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of by pike and dyke a tale of the rise of the dutch republic this librivox recording is in the public domain by pike and dyke by g a henty chapter twenty the spanish fury in a very short time the countess and her daughter returned to the room where ned was awaiting them each carried a handbag we are ready now the countess said i have my jewels and purse as for the things we leave behind they are scarce worth the taking by the spaniards Locking the door of the house behind them, the three women accompanied Ned down to the riverside. He took the first boat that came to hand and rowed them down to the fleet, which was moored a quarter of a mile below the town. He passed the first ship or two, and then rowed to one with whose captain he was acquainted. "'Captain Enkin,' he said, "'I have brought on board two ladies who have long been in hiding, waiting an opportunity of being taken to Holland, the Countess von Harp and her daughter.' I fear greatly that Antwerp will fall to-day, and wish, therefore, to place them in safety before the fight begins. Before sunset, unless I am mistaken, you will have a crowd of fugitives on board. I am very pleased, madam, the captain said, bowing to the countess, to receive you, and beg to hand over my cabin for your use. The name you bear is known to all Dutchmen, and even were it not so, any one introduced to me by my good friend Captain Martin would be heartily welcome are you going to return on shore he asked ned yes i must do so ned replied i promised the governor to stand by him to the last 
and as he has scarce a soul on whom he can rely it is clearly my duty to do so it is not for me to shirk doing my duty as long as i can because i fear that the day will go against us you will have difficulty in getting off again if the spaniards once enter the city the captain said there will be such a rush to the boats that they will be swamped before they leave shore i have a boat hidden away in which i hope to bring off the governor with me ned replied as to myself i can swim like a fish mind and get rid of your armor before you try it all the swimming in the world could not save you if you jumped in with all that steel mail on you i will bear it in mind ned said good-bye countess good-bye frulein gertrude i trust to see you at nightfall if not before that is a very gallant young officer captain enkin said as the two ladies sat watching ned as he rode to the shore you addressed him as captain martin the countess said yes he has been a captain in the prince's service fully three years the sailor said and fought nobly at alkmaar at the naval battle on the zuider zee and in the sea fight when we drove romero's fleet back in bergen he stands very high in the confidence of the prince but i do not think he is in our service now he is often with the prince but i believe he comes and goes between england and holland and is men say the messenger by whom private communication between the queen of england and the prince are chiefly carried he is young to have such confidence reposed in him the countess said yes he is young captain enkin replied not i suppose beyond seven or eight and twenty he was a captain and high in the prince's confidence when i first knew him three years ago so he must surely have been four or five and twenty then and yet indeed now you speak of it methinks he is greatly bigger now than he was then i do not think he was much taller than i am and now he tops me by nigh a head but i must surely be mistaken as to that for the prince would scarcely place his confidence in a mere lad the countess made no reply though she exchanged a quiet smile with her daughter they knew that ned could not be much more than twenty he was he had said about three years older than gertrude and she had passed seventeen but by a few months ned on returning to shore tied up the boat and then proceeded to the palace of the governor a servant was holding a horse at the door the governor ordered this horse to be ready and saddled for you sir when you arrived and begged you to join him at once in the market-place where he is telling off the troops to their various stations leaping on the horse ned rode to the market-place and at once placed himself under orders of the governor there is nothing much for you to do at present champagny said the troops are all in their places and we are ready when they deliver the assault it was not until eleven o'clock that the spaniards advanced to the attack three thousand of them under their aletto by the street of st michael the remainder with the germans commanded by romero by that of st george no sooner did the compact masses approach the barricades than the walloons who had been so loud in their boasts of valor and had insisted upon having the post of danger broke and fled their commander Hav, at their head and the spaniards springing over the ramparts poured into the streets fetch up the germans from the exchange champagny shouted to ned and leaping his horse over a garden wall he himself rode to another station and brought up the troops there and led them in person to bar the road to the enemy trying in vain to rally the flying walloons he met on the way for a few minutes the two parties of germans made a brave stand but they were unable to resist the weight and number of the spaniards who bore them down by sheer force champagny had fought gallantly in the melee and ned keeping closely beside him had well seconded his efforts but when the germans were borne down they rode off dashing through the streets and shouting to the burghers everywhere to rise in defense of their homes they answered to the appeal the bodies already collected at the exchange and cattle market moved forward and from every house the men poured out the spanish columns had already divided and were pouring down the streets with savage cries the german cavalry of Havre under van eude at once deserted and joining the spanish cavalry fell upon the townsmen in vain the burghers and such of the german infantry as remained faithful strove to resist their assailants although they had been beaten off in their assaults upon breaches the spaniards had ever proved themselves invincible on level ground and now inspired alike by the fury for slaughter and the lust for gold there was no withstanding them round the exchange some of the bravest defenders made a rally and burghers and germans mingled together fought stoutly until they were all slain 
there was another long struggle round the town hall one of the most magnificent buildings in europe and for a time the resistance was effective until the spanish cavalry and the germans under the traitor van Erd charged down upon the defenders then they took refuge in the buildings and every house became a fortress and from window and balcony a hot fire was poured into the square but now a large number of camp followers who had accompanied the spaniards came up with torches which had been specially prepared for firing the town and in a short time the city hall and other edifices in the square were in flames the fire spread rapidly from house to house and from street to street until nearly a thousand buildings in the most splendid and wealthy portion of the city were in a blaze in the street behind the town hall a last stand was made here the margrave of the city the burgomasters senators soldiers and citizens fought to the last until not one remained to wield a sword when resistance had ceased the massacre began women children and old men were killed in vast numbers or driven into the river to drown there then the soldiers scattered on the work of plunder the flames had already snatched treasures estimated at six millions from their grasp but there was still abundance for all the most horrible tortures were inflicted upon men women and children to force them to reveal the hiding places where they were supposed to have concealed their wealth and for three days a pandemonium reigned in the city two thousand five hundred had been slain double that number burned and drowned these are the lowest estimates many placing the killed at much higher figures champagny had fought very valiantly joining any party of soldiers or citizens he saw making a defence at last when the town hall was in flames and all hope over he said to ned who had kept throughout the day at his side it is no use throwing away our lives let us cut our way out of the city i have a boat lying in readiness at the bridge ned said if we can once reach the stairs we can make our way off to the fleet as they approached the river they saw a spanish column crossing the street ahead of them putting spurs to their horses they galloped on at full speed and bursting into it hewed their way through and continued their course followed however by a number of spanish infantry these are the steps ned exclaimed leaping from his horse champagny followed his example the spaniards were but twenty yards behind if you pull on that rope attached to the ring a boat lying under the bridge will come to you ned said i will keep them back till you are ready ned turned and faced the spaniards and for two or three minutes kept them at bay his armor was good and though many blows struck him he was uninjured while several of the spaniards fell under his sweeping blows they fell back for a moment surprised at his strength and at this instant the governor called out that all was ready ned turned and rushed down the steps the governor was already in the boat ned leaped on board and with a stroke of his sword severed the head rope before the leading spaniards reached the bottom of the steps the boat was a length away ned seated himself and seizing the oars rowed down the river several shots were fired at them from the bridge and wharves as they went but they passed on uninjured ned rowed to the admiral's ship and left the governor there and then rowed to that of captain enkin welcome back the captain said heartily i had begun to fear that ill had befallen you a few fugitives came off at noon with the news that the spaniards had entered the city and all was lost since then the roar of musketry mingled with shouts and yells has been unceasing and that tremendous fire in the heart of the city told its own tale for the last three hours the river has been full of floating corpses and the countess and her daughter who until then remained on deck retired to pray in their cabin the number of fugitives who have reached the ships is very small doubtless they crowded into such boats as there were and sank them at any rate but few have made their way out and those chiefly at the beginning of the fight now we had best let the ladies know you are here for they have been in the greatest anxiety about you ned went to the cabin door and knocked i have returned countess in a moment the door opened welcome back indeed captain martin she said we had begun to fear that we should never see you again thankful indeed am i that you have escaped through this terrible day are you unhurt she asked looking at his bruised and dented armor and at his clothes which were splashed with blood i have a few trifling cuts he replied but nothing worth speaking of i am truly thankful countess that you and your daughter put off with me this morning yes indeed the countess said i shudder when i think what would have happened had we been there in the city what a terrible sight it is 
it is indeed ned replied the shades of night had now fallen and over a vast space the flames were mounting high and a pall of red smoke interspersed with myriads of sparks and flakes of fire hung over the captured city occasional discharges of guns were still heard and the shrieks of women and the shouts of men rose in confused din it was an immense relief to all on board when an hour later the admiral fearing that the spaniards might bring artillery to bear upon the fleet ordered the anchors to be weighed and the fleet to drop a few miles below the town after taking off his armor washing the blood from his wounds and having them bound up and attiring himself in a suit lent him by the captain until he should get to delft where he had left his valise ned partook of a good meal for he had taken nothing but a manchet of bread and a cup of wine since the previous night he then went into the cabin and spent the evening in conversation with the countess and her daughter the latter of whom had changed since they had last met to the full as much as he had himself done she had been a girl of fourteen slim and somewhat tall for her age and looking pale and delicate from the life of confinement and anxiety they had led at brussels and their still greater anxiety at maastricht she was now budding into womanhood her figure was lissom and graceful her face was thoughtful and intelligent and gave promise of rare beauty in another year or two he learned that they had remained for a time in the village to which they had first gone and had then moved to another a few miles away and had there lived quietly in a small house placed at their disposal by one of their friends here they had remained unmolested until two months before when the excesses committed throughout the country by the mutinous soldiery rendered it unsafe for any one to live outside the walls of the town they then removed to antwerp where there was far more religious toleration than at brussels and the countess had resumed her own name though still living in complete retirement in the house in which ned had so fortunately found her the times have altered me for the better the countess said the spaniards have retired from that part of friesland where some of my estates are situated and those to whom alva granted them have had to fly i have a faithful steward there and since they have left he has collected the rents and has remitted to me such portions as i required sending over the rest to england to the charge of a banker there as it may be that the spaniards will again sweep over friesland where they still hold some of the principal towns i thought it best instead of having my money placed in holland where no one can foresee the future to send it to england where at least one can find a refuge and a right to exercise our religion i would that you would go there at once countess for surely at present holland is no place for two unprotected ladies nothing would give my mother greater pleasure than to receive you until you can find a suitable home for yourselves my sisters are but little older than your daughter and would do all in their power to make her at home they too speak your language and there are thousands of your compatriots in london what do you say gertrude the countess asked but i know that your mind has been so long made up that it is needless to question you yes indeed mother i would gladly go away anywhere from here where for the last six years there has been nothing but war and bloodshed if we could go back and live in friesland among our own people in safety and peace i should be delighted to do so but this country is as strange to us as england would be our friends stand aloof from us and we are ever in fear either of persecution or murder by the spanish soldiers i should be so glad to be away from it all and as captain martin says there are so many of our own people in london that it would scarce feel a strange land to us you have said over and over again that you would gladly go if you could get away and now that we can do so surely it will be better and happier for us than to go on as we have done of course it would be better in holland than it has been here for the last four years because we should be amongst protestants but we shall be still exposed to the dangers of invasion and the horrors of sieges it is as my daughter says captain martin our thoughts have long been turning to england as a refuge in the early days of the troubles i had thought of france where so many of our people went but since st bartholomew it has been but too evident that there is neither peace nor safety for those of the religion there and that in england alone can we hope to be permitted to worship unmolested therefore now that the chance is open to us we will not refuse it i do not say that we will cross at once we have many friends at rotterdam and delft and the prince held my husband in high esteem in the happy days before the troubles therefore i shall tarry there for a while but it will be for a time only it will not be long before the spanish again resume their war of conquest 
besides we are sick of the tales of horror that come to us daily and long for calm and tranquillity which we cannot hope to obtain in holland had i a husband or brothers i would share their fate whatever it was but being alone and unable to aid the cause in any way it would be folly to continue here and endure trials and risks you say that you come backwards and forwards often well then in two months we shall be ready to put ourselves under your protection and to sail with you for england the next morning the admiral dispatched a ship to rotterdam with the news of the fate of antwerp and ned obtained a passage in her for himself the ladies and servant and on arriving at rotterdam saw them bestowed in comfortable lodgings he then after an interview with the prince went on board a ship just leaving for england and upon his arrival reported to the minister and afterwards to the queen herself the terrible massacre of which he had been a witness in antwerp the Spanish fury, as the sack of Antwerp was termed, vastly enriched the soldiers, but did small benefit to the cause of Spain. The attack was wanton and unprovoked. Antwerp had not risen in rebellion against Philip, but had been attacked solely for the sake of plunder, and all Europe was shocked at the atrocities that had taken place, and at the slaughter, which was even greater than the massacre in Paris on the eve of St. Bartholomew. The queen remonstrated in indignant terms, the feeling among the Protestants in Germany was equally strong, and even in France public feeling condemned the act. In the Netherlands the feeling of horror and indignation was universal. The fate that had befallen Antwerp might be that of any other sister city. Everywhere petitions were signed in favor of the unity of all the Netherlands under the Prince of Orange. Philip's new governor, Don John, had reached the Netherlands on the very day of the sack of Antwerp, and endeavored to allay the storm of indignation it had excited by various concessions, but the feeling of unity, and with it of strength, had grown so rapidly that the demands of the commissioners advanced in due proportion, and they insisted upon nothing less than the restoration of their ancient constitution, the right to manage their internal affairs, and the departure of all the Spanish troops from the country. Don John parleyed and parried the demands, and months were spent in unprofitable discussions, while all the time he was working secretly among the nobles of Brabant and Flanders, who were little disposed to see with complacency the triumph of the democracy of the towns and the establishment of religious toleration. Upon all other points Don John and his master were ready to yield. The Spanish troops were sent away to Italy, the Germans only being retained. The constitutional rights would have all been conceded, but on the question of religious tolerance Philip stood firm. At last, seeing that no agreement would ever be arrived at, both parties again prepared for war. The Queen of England had lent one hundred thousand pounds on the security of the cities, and the pause in hostilities during the negotiations had not been altogether wasted in Holland. There had been a municipal insurrection in Amsterdam, the magistrates devoted to Philip had been driven out, and to the great delight of Holland, Amsterdam, its capital, that had long been a stronghold of the enemy, a gate through which he could at will pour his forces, was restored to it in antwerp and several others of the cities of brabant and flanders the citizens raised the citadels by which they had been overawed men women and children uniting in the work tearing down and carrying away the stones of the fortress that had worked them such evil antwerp had at the departure of the spanish troops been again garrisoned by germans who had remained inactive during this exhibition of the popular will the Prince of Orange himself had paid a visit to the city, and had, at the invitation of Brussels, proceeded there, and had received an enthusiastic reception, and for a time it seemed that the plans for which so many years he had struggled were at last to be crowned with success. But his hopes were frustrated by the treachery of the nobles and the cowardice of the army the patriots had engaged in their service. Many of the Spanish troops had been secretly brought back again, and Don John was preparing for a renewal of war. Unknown to the Prince of Orange, numbers of the nobles had invited the Archduke Matthias, brother of the Emperor Rudolf of Germany, to assume the government. Matthias, without consultation with his brother, accepted the invitation and journeyed privately to the Netherlands. Had the Prince of Orange declared against him he must at once have returned to Vienna, but this would have aroused the anger of the Emperor and the whole of Germany. 
had the prince upon the other hand abandoned the field and retired into holland he would have played into the hands of his adversaries accordingly he received matthias at antwerp with great state and the archduke was well satisfied to place himself in the hands of the most powerful man in the country the prince's position was greatly strengthened by the queen instructing her ministers to inform the envoy of the netherlands that she would feel compelled to withdraw all succor of the states if the prince of orange was deprived of his leadership as it was upon him alone that she relied for success the prince was thereupon appointed rouvard of brabant a position almost analogous to that of dictator ghent which was second only in importance to antwerp rose almost immediately turned out the catholic authorities and declared in favor of the prince a new act of union was signed at brussels and the estates general passed a resolution declaring don john to be no longer governor or stadtholder of the netherlands the prince of orange was appointed lieutenant-general for matthias and the actual power of the latter was reduced to a nullity but he was installed at brussels with the greatest pomp and ceremony don john who had by this time collected an army of twenty thousand veterans at namur and had been joined by the prince of parma a general of great vigor and ability now marched against the army of the estates of which the command had been given to the nobles of the country in the hope of binding them firmly to the national cause the patriot army fell back before that of the spaniards but were soon engaged by a small body of cavalry alexander of parma came up with some twelve hundred horse dashed boldly across a dangerous swamp and fell upon their flank the estates cavalry at once turned and fled and parma then fell upon the infantry and in the course of an hour not only defeated but almost exterminated them from seven thousand to eight thousand being killed and six hundred taken prisoners the latter being executed without mercy by don john the loss of the spaniards was only about ten men this extraordinary disproportion of numbers and the fact that twelve hundred men so easily defeated a force ten times more numerous completely dashed to the ground the hopes of the netherlands and showed how utterly incapable were its soldiers of contending in the field with the veterans of spain the battle was followed by the rapid reduction of a large number of towns most of which surrendered without resistance as soon as the spanish troops approached in the meantime the estates had assembled another army which was joined by one composed of twelve thousand germans under duke casimir both armies were rendered inactive by want of funds and the situation was complicated by the entry of the duke of alencon the brother of the king of france into the netherlands don john the hero of the battle of lepanto who had shown himself on many battlefields to be at once a great commander and a valiant soldier was prostrate by disease brought on by vexation partly at the difficulties he had met with since his arrival in the netherlands partly at the neglect of spain to furnish him with money with which he could set his army now numbering thirty thousand in motion and sweep aside all resistance at this critical moment his malady increased and after a week's illness he expired just two years after his arrival in the netherlands he was succeeded at first temporarily and afterwards permanently by alexander of parma also a great commander and possessing far greater resolution than his unfortunate predecessor the two years had been spent by edward martin in almost incessant journeyings between london and the netherlands he now held however a position much superior to that which he had formerly occupied the queen after hearing from him his account of the sack of antwerp and his share in the struggle had said to the secretary i think that it is only just that we should bestow upon captain martin some signal mark of our approbation at the manner in which he has for two years devoted himself to our service and that without pay or reward but solely from his loyalty to our person and from his good will towards the state kneel captain martin the queen took the sword that walsingham handed to her and said rise sir edward martin you will draw out mr secretary our new knight's appointment as our special envoy to the prince of orange and see that he has proper appointments for such a post his duties will as before be particular to myself and the prince and will not clash in any way with those of our envoy at the hague the delight of ned's mother and sisters when he returned home and informed them of the honor that the queen had been pleased to bestow upon him was great indeed his father said well ned i must congratulate you with the others though i had hoped to make a sailor of you 
however circumstances have been too much for me i own that you have been thrust into this work rather by fortune than design and as it is so i am heartily glad that you have succeeded it seems strange to me that my boy should have become sir edward martin an officer in the service of her majesty and i say frankly that just at present i would rather that it had been otherwise but i suppose i shall get accustomed to it in time and assuredly none but myself will doubt for a moment that you have gained greatly by all this honor and dignity queen elizabeth although in some respects parsimonious in the extreme was liberal to her favorites and the new-made knight stood high in her liking she loved to have good-looking men about her and without being actually handsome ned martin with his height and breadth of shoulder his easy and upright carriage his frank open face and sunny smile was pleasant to look upon he had served her excellently for two years had asked for no rewards or favors but had borne himself modestly and been content to wait therefore the queen was pleased to order her treasurer to issue a commission to sir edward martin as her majesty's special envoy to the prince of orange with such appointments as would enable him handsomely to support his new dignity and his position as her representative even captain martin was now bound to confess that ned had gained profit as well as honor he did indeed warn his son not to place too much confidence in princes but ned replied i do not think the queen is fickle in her likes and dislikes father but i rely not upon this but on doing my duty to the state for further employment i have had extraordinary good fortune too and have without any merit save that of always doing my best mounted step by step from the deck of the good venture to knighthood and employment by the state the war appears to me to be as far from coming to an end as it did six years ago and if i continue to acquit myself to the satisfaction of the lord treasurer and council i hope that at its conclusion i may be employed upon such further work as i am fitted for you speak rightly ned and i am wrong to feel anxiety about your future when you have already done so well and now ned you had best go into the city and order from some tailor who supplies the court such suits as are fitting to your new rank the queen loves brave dresses and bright colors and you must cut as good a figure as the rest you have been somewhat of an expense to me these last two years but that is over now and i can well afford the additional outlay to start you worthily what was good enough for captain martin is not good enough for sir edward martin therefore stint not expense in any way i should not like that you should not hold your own with the young fops of the court it was well that ned had provided himself with a new outfit for he was not sent abroad again for more than a month and during that time he was almost daily at court receiving from the royal chamberlain a notification that the queen expected to see him at all entertainments at the first of these lord walsingham introduced him to many of the young nobles of the court speaking very highly of the services he had rendered and as the queen was pleased to speak often to him and to show him marked favor he was exceedingly well received and soon found himself at ease he was nevertheless glad when the order came for him to proceed again to holland with messages to the prince of orange upon his arrival there he was warmly congratulated by the prince you have well earned your rank the prince said i take some pride to myself in having so soon discovered that you had good stuff in you there are some friends of yours here who will be glad to hear of the honor that has befallen you the countess von harp and her daughter have been here for the last six weeks i have seen them several times and upon each occasion they spoke to me of their gratitude for the services you have rendered them one of my pages will show you where they are lodging they are about to proceed to england and i think their decision is a wise one for this country is at present no place for unprotected women the countess and her daughter were alike surprised and pleased when ned was announced as sir edward martin and when a fortnight later ned sailed for england they took passage in the same ship ned had sent word to his mother by a vessel that sailed a week previously that they would arrive with him and the best room in the house had been got in readiness for them and they received a hearty welcome from ned's parents and sisters they stayed a fortnight there and then established themselves in a pretty little house in the village of dulwich one of ned's sisters accompanied them to stay for a time as gertrude's friend and companion whenever ned returned home he was a frequent visitor at dulwich and at the end of two years his sisters were delighted but not surprised when he returned one day and told them that gertrude von harp had accepted him 
the marriage was not to take place for a time for ned was still young and the countess thought it had best be delayed she was now receiving a regular income from her estates for it had been a time of comparative peace in holland and that country was increasing fast in wealth and prosperity alexander of parma had by means of his agents corrupted the greater part of the nobility of flanders and brabant had laid siege to maastricht and after a defence even more gallant and desperate than that of harlem and several terrible repulses of his soldiers had captured the city and put the greater part of its inhabitants men and women to the sword after vain entreaties to elizabeth to assume the sovereignty of the netherlands this had been offered to the duke of anjou brother of the king of france the choice appeared to be a politic one for anjou was at the time the all but accepted suitor of queen elizabeth and it was thought that the choice would unite both powers in the defence of holland the duke however speedily proved his incapacity irritated at the smallness of the authority granted him and the independent attitude of the great towns he attempted to capture them by force he was successful in several places but at antwerp where the french thought to repeat the spanish success and to sack the city the burghers gathered so strongly and fiercely that the french troops employed were for the most part killed those who survived being ignominiously taken prisoners anjou retired with his army losing a large number of men on his retreat by the bursting of a dike and the flooding of the country by this time the prince of orange had accepted the sovereignty of holland and zealand which was now completely separated from the rest of the netherlands after the flight of anjou he received many invitations from the other provinces to accept their sovereignty but he steadily refused having no personal ambition and knowing well that no reliance whatever could be placed upon the nobles of brabant and flanders End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of By Pike and Dyke, A Tale of the Rise of the Dutch Republic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By Pike and Dyke by G. A. Henty. Chapter Twenty One The Siege of Antwerp. On the tenth of July, fifteen eighty four, a deep gloom was cast over all Holland and England by the assassination of the Prince of Orange. Many attempts had been made upon his life by paid agents of the King of Spain one had been nearly successful and the prince had lain for weeks almost at the point of death at last the hatred of philip and parma gained its end and the prince fell a victim to the bullet of an assassin who came before him disguised as a petitioner his murderer was captured and put to death with horrible tortures boasting of his crime to the last it was proved beyond all question that he as well as the authors of the previous attempts was acting at the instigation of the spanish authorities and had been promised vast sums in the event of his success thus died the greatest statesman of his age a pure patriot a disinterested politician a great orator a man possessing at once immense talent unbounded perseverance a fortitude under misfortunes beyond proof and an unshakable faith in god but terrible as was the blow to the netherlands it failed to have the effect which its instigators had hoped from it on the very day of the murder the estates of holland then sitting at delft passed a resolution to maintain the good cause with god's help to the uttermost without sparing gold or blood the prince's eldest son had been kidnapped from school in leyden by philip's orders and had been a captive in spain for seventeen years under the tutorship of the jesuits maurice the next son now seventeen years old was appointed head of the state's council but the position of the netherlands was still well-nigh desperate flanders and brabant lay at the feet of the spaniards a rising which had lately taken place had been crushed bruges had surrendered without a blow the duke of parma with eighteen thousand troops besides his garrisons was threatening ghent mechlin brussels and antwerp and was freely using promises and bribery to induce them to surrender dendermond and vilvoorde both opened their gates the capitulation of the latter town cutting the communication between brussels and antwerp ghent followed the example and surrendered without striking a blow and at the moment of the assassination of the prince of orange parma's army was closing round antwerp 
Sir Edward Martin was at Antwerp, where he had gone by the Queen's order, when he received the news of the murder of the Prince, whom he had seen a few days before. He was filled with grief and horror at the loss of one who had been for six years his friend, and whom he regarded with enthusiastic admiration. It seemed to him at first that with the death of the Prince, the cause of the Netherlands was lost, and had the former attempts of Philip's emissaries upon the Prince's life been successful, such a result would no doubt have followed. But the successful defense of their cities, and the knowledge they had gained that the sea could be made to fight for them, had given the people of Holland strength and hope. Their material resources, too, were larger than before, for great numbers of the Protestants from the other provinces had emigrated there, and had added alike to their strength and wealth. At first, however, the news caused something like despair in Antwerp. Men went about depressed and sorrowful, as if they had lost their dearest friend. But Sante Aldegonde, who had been appointed by the prince to take charge of the defense of Antwerp, encouraged the citizens, and their determination to resist returned. Unfortunately, there had already been terrible blundering. William de Bois, Lord of Trelong and Admiral of the Fleet of Holland and Zealand, had been ordered to carry up to the city provisions and munitions of war sufficient to last for a year, the money having been freely voted by the States General of these provinces. But Trelong disobeyed the orders, and remained week after week at Ostend, drinking heavily and doing nothing else. At last the States, enraged by his disobedience, ordered him to be arrested and thrown into prison, but this was too late to enable the needed stores to be taken up to Antwerp. The citizens were under no uneasiness. They believed that it was absolutely impossible to block the river, and that, therefore, they could at all times receive supplies from the coast. On both sides of the river below the town the land was low, and could at any time be laid under water, and Sante Aldegonde brought the Prince of Orange's instructions that the great dyke, called Blavgaren, was to be pierced. This would have laid the country under water for miles, and even the blocking of the river would not have prevented the arrival of ships with provisions and supplies. Unfortunately Santa Aldegonde's power was limited. The butchers' guild rose against the proposal, and their leaders appeared before the magistrates and protested against the step being carried out. Twelve thousand cattle grazed upon the pastures which would be submerged, and the destruction of farms, homesteads, and orchards would be terrible. As to the blocking up of the river, the idea was absurd, and the operation far beyond the power of man. The butchers were supported by the officers of the militia, who declared that were the authorities to attempt the destruction of the dyke, the municipal soldiery would oppose it by force. Such was the state of things when the only man whom the democracy would listen to and obey fell by the assassin's knife, and his death and the obstinate stupidity of the burghers of Antwerp sealed the fate of the city. Sante Aldegonde had hailed the arrival of Elizabeth's envoy, and consulted with him as to the steps to be taken for the defense of the city. He himself did not believe in the possibility of the river being stopped. It was nearly half a mile in width and sixty feet in depth, with a tidal rise and fall of eleven feet. Ned agreed with the governor or burgomaster, for this was St. Aldegonde's title, that the work of blocking this river seemed impossible, but his reliance upon the opinion of the prince was so great that he did what he could towards persuading the populace to permit the plans to be carried out. But Elizabeth had so often disappointed the people of the Netherlands that her envoy possessed no authority, and the magistrates, with whom were the wardmasters, the deans of all the guilds, the presidents of chambers and heads of colleges, squabbled and quarreled among themselves, and nothing was done. The garrison consisted only of a regiment of English under Colonel Morgan and a Scotch regiment under Colonel Balfour, but these were in a state of indiscipline, and a mutiny had shortly before broken out among them. Many of the troops had deserted to Parma and some had returned home, and it was not until Morgan had beheaded Captain Lee and Captain Powell that order was restored among them. Beside these were the burgher militia, who were brave and well-trained, but insubordinate, and ready on every occasion to refuse obedience to authority. The first result of the general confusion which prevailed in Antwerp was that Herenthal's was allowed to fall without assistance. Had this small but important city been succored, it would have enabled Antwerp to protract its own defense for some time. The veteran Mondragon, as he took possession, remarked, Now it is easy to see that the Prince of Orange is dead. 
and indeed it was only under his wise supervision and authority that anything like concerted action between the cities, which were really small republics, was possible. Quietly but steadily the Duke of Parma established fortified posts at various points on both banks of the lower Skelt, thereby rendering its navigation more difficult, and covering in some degree the spot where he intended to close the river. Nine miles below the city were two forts, Lillo and Liefkenshuk, one on either side of the stream. The fortifications of Lillo were complete, but those of Liefkenshuk were not finished when Parma ordered the Marquis of Richburg to carry it by assault. It was taken by surprise, and the eight hundred men who composed its garrison were all killed or drowned. This first blow took place on the very day the Prince of Orange was killed. Lillo was garrisoned by Antwerp volunteers, called the Young Bachelors, together with a company of French under Captain Gascoigne, and four hundred Scotch and Englishmen under Colonel Morgan. Mondragon was ordered to take the place at any cost. He took up his position with five thousand men at the country house and farm of Lillo a short distance from the fort, planted his batteries, and opened fire. The fort responded briskly, and finding that the walls were little injured by his artillery fire, Mondragon tried to take it by mining. Teligny, however, ran countermines, and for three weeks the siege continued, the Spaniards gaining no advantage and losing a considerable number of men. At last Teligny made a sortie, and a determined action took place without advantage on either side. The defenders were then recalled to the fort, the sluice gates were opened, and the waters of the Skelt, swollen by a high tide, poured over the country. Swept by the fire of the guns of the fort and surrounded by water, the Spaniards were forced to make a rapid retreat, struggling breast high in the waves. Seeing the uselessness of the siege, the attempt to capture Lillo was abandoned, having cost the Spaniards no less than two thousand lives. Parma's own camp was on the opposite side of the river, at the villages of Beverin, Kalu, and Borgt, and he was thus nearly opposite to Antwerp, as the river swept round with a sharp curve. He had with him half his army, while the rest were at Stabruck, on the opposite side of the river, nearly ten miles below Antwerp. Kalo stood upon rising ground, and was speedily transformed into a bustling town. From this point an army of men dug a canal to Steken, a place on the river above Antwerp twelve miles from Kalu, and as soon as Ghent and Dendermond had fallen, great rafts of timber, fleets of boats laden with provisions, munitions, building materials, and every other requisite for the great undertaking Parma had in view, were brought to Kalu. To this place was brought also by Parma's orders the shipwrights, masons, rope-makers, sailors, boatmen, bakers, brewers, and butchers of Flanders and Brabant, and work went on unceasingly. But while the autumn wore on the river was still open, and in spite of the Spanish batteries on the banks the daring sailors of Zeeland brought up their ships laden with corn to Antwerp, where the price was already high. Had this traffic been continued Antwerp would soon have been provisioned for a year's siege but the folly and stupidity of the municipal authorities put a stop to it, for they enacted that, instead of the high prices current for grain, which had tempted the Zealanders to run the gauntlet of the Spanish batteries, a price but little above that obtainable in other places should be given. The natural result was, the supply of provisions ceased at once. "'Did you ever see anything like the obstinacy and folly of these burghers?' Sante Aldegonde said in despair to Ned, when, in spite of his entreaties, this suicidal edict had been issued. "'What possible avail is it to endeavour to defend a city which seems bent on its own destruction?' "'The best thing to do,' Ned replied in great anger, "'would be to surround the town hall with the companies of Morgan's regiment remaining here, and to hang every one of these thick-headed and insolent tradesmen.' It would be the best way, Santa Aldegonde agreed, if we had also a sufficient force to keep down the city. These knaves think vastly more of their own privileges than of the good of the state, or even of the safety of the town. Here, as in Ghent, the people are divided into sections and parties, who, when there is no one else to quarrel with, are ever ready to fly at each other's throats. Each of these leaders of guilds and presidents of chambers considers himself a little god, and it is quite enough if any one else expresses an opinion for the majority to take up at once the opposite view. 
i looked in at the town hall yesterday ned said and such an uproar was going on that no one could be heard to speak twenty men were on their feet at once shouting and haranguing and paying not the slightest attention to each other while the rest joined in from time to time with deafening cries and yells never did i see such a scene and it is upon such men as these that it rests to decide upon the measures to be taken for the safety of the city ah if we had but the prince here among us again for a few hours there would be some hope sante aldegonde said for he would be able to persuade the people that in times like these there is no safety in many counsellors but that they must be content for the time to obey one man on the flemish side of the river the sluices had been opened at saftingen the whole country there with the exception of the ground on which kalu and the other villages stood was under water still the blavgaren dyke and an inner dyke called the kovensten barred back the water which had it free course would have turned the country into a sea and given passage to the fleets of zealand now that it was too late those who had so fiercely opposed the plan at first were eager that these should be cut but it was now out of their power to do so the lord of Covenston, who had a castle upon the dyke which bore his name, had repeatedly urged upon the Antwerp magistracy the extreme importance of cutting through this dyke, even if they deferred the destruction of the outer one. Enraged at their obstinacy and folly, and having the Spanish armies all round him, he made terms with Parma, and the Spaniards established themselves firmly along the bank, built strong redoubts upon it, and stationed five thousand men there as the prince had foreseen the opening of the saftingen sluice had assisted parma instead of adding to his difficulties for he was now no longer confined to the canal but was able to bring a fleet of large vessels laden with cannon and ammunition from ghent down the skelt and in through a breach through the dyke of bort to kalu sante aldegonde in order to bar the borked passage built a work called fort Teligny upon the dyke opposite that thrown up by the spaniards and in the narrow passage between them constant fighting went on between the spaniards and patriots still the people of antwerp felt confident for the skelt was still open and when food became short the zealand fleet could at any time sail up to their assistance but before winter closed in parma commenced the work for which he had made such mighty preparations between kalu and ordum on the opposite side a sandbar had been discovered which somewhat diminished the depth of the stream and rendered pile driving comparatively easy a strong fort was erected on each bank and the work of driving in the piles began from each side a framework of heavy timber supported on these massive piles was carried out so far that the width of open water was reduced from twenty four to thirteen hundred feet and strong blockhouses were erected upon each pier to protect them from assault had a concerted attack been made by the antwerp ships from above and the zealand fleet from below the works could at this time have been easily destroyed but the fleet had been paralyzed by the insubordination of treilong and there was no plan or concert so that although constant skirmishing went on no serious attack was made the brave teligny one night going down in a rowboat to communicate with the zealanders and arrange for joint action was captured by the spanish boats and remained for six years in prison his loss was a very serious blow to antwerp and to the cause on the thirteenth of november parma sent in a letter to antwerp begging the citizens to take compassion on their wives and children and make terms parma had none of the natural bloodthirstiness of alva and would have been really glad to have arranged matters without further fighting especially as he was almost without funds and the attitude of the king of france was so doubtful that he knew that at any moment his plans might be overthrown the states in january attempted to make a diversion in favor of antwerp by attacking bois le duc a town from which the spaniards drew a large portion of their supplies parma although feeling the extreme importance of this town had been able to spare no men for its defence and although it was strong and its burghers notably brave and warlike it seemed that it might be readily captured by surprise count hohenlohe was entrusted with the enterprise and with four thousand infantry and two hundred cavalry advanced towards the place fifty men under an officer who knew the town hid at night near the gate and when in the morning the portcullis was lifted rushed in overpowered the guard and threw open the gate and hohenlohe with his two hundred troopers and five hundred pikemen entered 
these at once instead of securing the town scattered to plunder it happened that forty spanish lancers and thirty foot soldiers had come into the town the night before to form an escort for a convoy of provisions they were about starting when the tumult broke out as hohenlohe's troops thought of nothing but pillage time was given to the burghers to seize their arms and they with the little body of troops fell upon the plunderers who at the sight of the spanish uniforms were seized with a panic hohenlohe galloped to the gate to bring in the rest of the troops but while he was away one of its guards although desperately wounded at its capture crawled to the ropes which held up the portcullis and cut them with his knife thus those within were cut off from their friends many of them were killed others threw themselves from the walls into the moat and very few of those who had entered made their escape when hohenlohe returned with two thousand fresh troops and found the gates shut in his face he had nothing to do but to ride away the enterprise having failed entirely through his own folly and recklessness for it was he himself who had encouraged his followers to plunder had he kept them together until the main force entered no resistance could have been offered to him or had he when he rode out to fetch reinforcements left a guard at the gate to prevent its being shut the town could again have been taken parma himself wrote to philip acknowledging that had the rebels succeeded in their enterprise i should have been compelled to have abandoned the siege of antwerp but now the winter upon which the people in antwerp had chiefly depended for preventing the blocking of the stream was upon the besiegers the great river lashed by storms into fury and rolling huge masses of ice up and down with the tide beat against the piers and constantly threatened to carry them away but the structure was enormously strong the piles had been driven fifty feet into the river bed and withstood the force of the stream and on the twenty fifth of february the skelt was closed parma had from the first seen that it was absolutely impossible to drive piles across the deep water between the piers and had prepared to connect them with a bridge of boats for this purpose he had constructed thirty-two great barges each sixty-two feet in length and twelve in breadth these were moored in pairs with massive chains and anchors the distance between each pair being twenty-two feet all were bound together with chains and timbers and a roadway protected by a parapet of massive beams was formed across it each boat was turned into a fortress by the erection of solid wood redoubts at each end mounting heavy guns and was manned by thirty-two soldiers and four sailors the forts at the end of the bridge each mounted ten great guns and twenty armed vessels with heavy pieces of artillery were moored in front of each fort thus the structure was defended by one hundred seventy great guns as an additional protection to the bridge two heavy rafts each twelve hundred fifty feet long composed of empty barrels heavy timbers ships masts and woodwork bound solidly together were moored at some little distance above and below the bridge of boats these rafts were protected by projecting beams of wood tipped with iron to catch any vessels floating down upon them the erection of this structure was one of the most remarkable military enterprises ever carried out now that it was too late the people of antwerp bitterly bewailed their past folly which had permitted an enterprise that could at any moment have been interrupted to be carried to a successful issue but if something like despair seized the citizens at the sight of the obstacle that cut them off from all hope of succor the feelings of the great general whose enterprise and ability had carried out the work were almost as depressed his troops had dwindled to the mere shadow of an army the cavalry had nearly disappeared the garrisons in the various cities were starving and the burghers had no food either for the soldiers or themselves the troops were two years behindhand in their pay parma had long exhausted every means of credit and his appeals to his sovereign for money met with no response but while in his letters to philip he showed the feelings of despair which possessed him he kept a smiling countenance to all else a spy having been captured he ordered him to be conducted over every part of the encampment the forts and bridge were shown to him and he was requested to count the pieces of artillery and was then sent back to the town to inform the citizens of what he had seen at this moment brussels which had long been besieged was starved into surrender and parma was reinforced by the troops who had been engaged in the siege of that city a misfortune now befell him similar to that which the patriots had suffered at bois le duc 
he had experienced great inconvenience from not possessing a port on the sea-coast of flanders and consented to a proposal of la motte one of the most experienced of the walloon generals to surprise ostend on the night of the twenty ninth of march la motte with two thousand foot and twelve hundred cavalry surprised and carried the old port of the town leaving an officer in charge of the position he went back to bring up the rest of his force in his absence the soldiers scattered to plunder the citizens roused themselves killed many of them and put the rest to flight and by the time la motte returned with the fresh troops the panic had become so general that the enterprise had to be abandoned the people of antwerp now felt that unless some decisive steps were taken their fate was sealed a number of armed vessels sailed up from zealand and assisted by a detachment from fort lillo suddenly attacked and carried fort liefkenshoek which had been taken from them at the commencement of the siege and also fort st anthony lower down the river in advancing towards the latter fort they disobeyed santa aldegonde's express orders which were that they should after capturing liefkenshoek at once follow the dyke up the river to the point where it was broken near the fort at the end of the bridge and should there instantly throw up strong works had they followed out these orders they could from this point have battered the bridge and destroyed this barrier over the river but the delay caused by the attack on the fort st anthony was fatal for at night parma sent a strong body of soldiers and sappers in boats from kalu to the broken end of the dyke and these before morning threw up works on the very spot where santa aldegonde had intended the battery for the destruction of the bridge to be erected nevertheless the success was a considerable one the possession of lillo and liefkenshoek restored to the patriots the command of the river to within three miles of the bridge and enabled the zealand fleet to be brought up at that point another blow was now meditated there was in antwerp an italian named Giannobelli, a man of great science and inventive power he had first gone to spain to offer his inventions to philip but had met with such insolent neglect there that he had betaken himself in a rage to flanders swearing that the spaniards should repent their treatment of him he had laid his plans before the council of antwerp and had asked from them three ships of a hundred and fifty three hundred and fifty and five hundred tons respectively besides these he wanted sixty flat-bottomed scows had this request been complied with it is certain that parma's bridge would have been utterly destroyed but the leading men were building a great ship or floating castle of their own design from which they expected such great things that they christened it the end of the war Giannobelli had warned them that this ship would certainly turn out a failure however they persisted and instead of granting him the ships he wanted only gave him two small vessels of seventy and eighty tons although disgusted with their parsimony on so momentous an occasion Giannobelli set to work with the aid of two skilful artisans of antwerp to fit them up in the hold of each vessel a solid flooring of brick and mortar a foot thick was first laid down upon this was built a chamber of masonry forty feet long three and a half feet wide and as many high and with side walls five feet thick this chamber was covered with a roof six feet thick of tombstones placed edgeways and was filled with a powder of Giannobelli's own invention above was piled a pyramid of millstones cannon-balls chain-shot iron hooks and heavy missiles of all kinds and again over these were laid heavy marble slabs the rest of the hold was filled with paving stones one ship was christened the fortune and on this the mine was to be exploded by a slow match cut so as to explode at a calculated moment the mine on board the hope was to be started by a piece of clockwork which at the appointed time was to strike fire from a flint planks and woodwork were piled on the decks to give to the two vessels the appearance of simple fire ships thirty-two small craft saturated with tar and turpentine and filled with inflammable materials were to be sent down the river in detachments of eight every half hour to clear away if possible the raft above the bridge and to occupy the attention of the spaniards the fifth of april the day after the capture of the liefkenshoek was chosen for the attempt it began badly admiral jacobson who was in command instead of sending down the fireboats in batches as arranged sent them all off one after another and started the two mine ships immediately afterwards as soon as their approach was discovered the spaniards who had heard vague rumors that an attack by water was meditated at once got under arms and mustered upon the bridge and forts 
parma himself with all his principal officers superintended the arrangements as the fleet of small ships approached they burst into flames the spaniards silently watched the approaching danger but soon began to take heart again many of the boats grounded on the banks of the river before reaching their destination others burned out and sank while the rest drifted against the raft but were kept from touching it by the long projecting timbers and burned out without doing any damage then came the two ships the pilots as they neared the bridge escaped in boats and the current carried them down one on each side of the raft towards the solid ends of the bridge the fortune came first but grounded near the shore without touching the bridge just as it did so the slow match upon deck burnt out there was a faint explosion but no result and sir ronald york the man who had handed over zutphen sprang on board with a party of volunteers extinguished the fire smouldering on deck and thrusting their spears down into the hold endeavored to ascertain the nature of its contents finding it impossible to do so they returned to the bridge the Spaniards were now shouting with laughter at the impotent attempt of the Antwerpers to destroy the bridge, and were watching the Hope, which was now following her consort. She passed just clear of the end of the raft, and struck the bridge close to the blockhouse at the commencement of the floating portion. A fire was smouldering on her deck, and a party of soldiers at once sprang on board to extinguish this, as their comrades had done the fire on board the Fortune the marquis of richbourg standing on the bridge directed the operations the prince of parma was standing close by when an officer named vega moved by a sudden impulse fell on his knees and implored him to leave the place and not to risk a life so precious to spain moved by the officer's entreaties parma turned and walked along the bridge he had just reached the entrance to the fort when a terrific explosion took place the clockwork of the hope had succeeded better than the slow match in the fortune in an instant she disappeared and with her the blockhouse against which she had struck with all of its garrison a large portion of the bridge and all the troops stationed upon it the ground was shaken as if by an earthquake houses fell miles away and the air was filled with a rain of mighty blocks of stone some of which were afterwards found a league away a thousand soldiers were killed in an instant the rest were dashed to the ground stunned and bewildered the marquis of richbourg and most of parma's best officers were killed parma himself lay for a long time as if dead but presently recovered and set to work to do what he could to repair the disaster the zealand fleet were lying below only waiting for the signal to move up to destroy the rest of the bridge and carry succor to the city but the incompetent and cowardly jacob zoon rode hastily away after the explosion and the rocket that should have summoned the zealanders was never sent up parma moved about among his troops restoring order and confidence and as the night went on and no assault took place he set his men to work to collect drifting timbers and spars and make a hasty and temporary restoration in appearance at least of the ruined portion of the bridge it was not until three days afterwards that the truth that the bridge had been partially destroyed and that the way was open was known at antwerp but by this time it was too late the zealanders had retired the spaniards had recovered their confidence and were hard at work restoring the bridge from time to time fresh fireships were sent down but parma had now established a patrol of boats which went out to meet them and towed them to shore far above the bridge in the weeks that followed parma's army dwindled away from sickness brought on by starvation anxiety and overwork while the people of antwerp were preparing for an attack upon the dyke of Covenston. if that could be captured and broken parma's bridge would be rendered useless as the zealand fleet could pass up over the submerged country with aid parma was well aware of the supreme importance of this dyke he had fringed both its margins with breastworks of stakes and had strengthened the whole body of the dyke with timber work and piles where it touched the great skelt dyke a strong fortress called the holy cross had been constructed under the command of mondragon and at the further end in the neighborhood of mansfeldt's headquarters was another fort called the stabrook which commanded and raked the whole dyke on the body of the dyke itself were three strong forts a mile apart called st james st george and the fort of the palisades several attacks had been made from time to time both upon the bridge and dyke and at daybreak on the seventh of may a fleet from lillo under hohenlo landed five hundred zealanders upon it between st george's and fort palisade 
but the fleet that was to have come out from antwerp to his assistance never arrived and the zealanders were overpowered by the fire from the two forts and the attacks of the spaniards and retreated leaving four of their ships behind them and more than a fourth of their force upon the twenty sixth of the same month the grand attack from which the people of antwerp hoped so much took place two hundred vessels were ready a portion of these were to come up from zealand under hohenlohe the rest to advance from antwerp under sante aldegonde at two o'clock in the morning the spanish sentinels saw four fire-ships approaching the dyke they mustered reluctantly fearing a repetition of the previous explosion and retired to the fort when the fire-ships reached the stakes protecting the dyke they burned and exploded but without effecting much damage but in the meantime a swarm of vessels of various sizes were seen approaching it was the fleet of hohenlohe which had been sailing and rowing from ten o'clock on the previous night guided by the light of the fire-ships they approached the dyke and the zealanders sprang ashore and climbed up they were met by several hundred spanish troops who as soon as they saw the fire-ships burn out harmlessly sallied out from their forts the zealanders were beginning to give way when the antwerp fleet came up on the other side headed by sante aldegonde the new arrivals sprang from their boats and climbed the dyke the spaniards were driven off and three thousand men occupied all the space between fort george and the palisade fort with sante aldegonde came all the english and scotch troops in antwerp under balfour and morgan and many volunteers among whom was ned martin with hohenlohe came prince maurice william the silent's son a lad of eighteen with wool sacks sandbags planks and other materials the patriots now rapidly entrenched the position they had gained while a large body of sappers and miners set to work with picks mattocks and shovels tearing down the dyke the spaniards poured out from the forts but antwerpers dutchmen zealanders scotchmen and englishmen met them bravely and a tremendous conflict went on at each end of the narrow causeway both parties fought with the greatest obstinacy and for an hour there was no advantage on either side at last the patriots were victorious drove the spaniards back into their two forts and following up their success attacked the palisade fort its outworks were in their hands when a tremendous cheer was heard the sappers and miners had done their work salt water poured through the broken dyke and a zealand barge freighted with provisions floated triumphantly into the water beyond now no longer an inland sea then when the triumph seemed achieved another fatal mistake was made by the patriots sante aldegonde and hohenlohe the two commanders of the enterprise both leapt on board anxious to be the first to carry the news of the victory to antwerp where they arrived in triumph and set all the bells ringing and bonfires blazing for three hours the party on the dyke remained unmolested parma was at his camp four leagues away and in ignorance of what had been done and mansfeldt could send no word across to him the latter held a council of war but it seemed that nothing could be done three thousand men were entrenched on the narrow dyke covered by the guns of a hundred and sixty zealand ships some of the officers were in favor of waiting until nightfall but at last the advice of a gallant officer camillo capazuca colonel of the italian legion carried the day in favor of an immediate assault and the italians and spaniards marched together from fort stabruck to the palisade fort which was now in extremity they came in time drove back the assailants and were preparing to advance against them when a distant shout from the other end of the dyke told that parma had arrived there mondragon moved from the holy cross to fort george and from that fort and from the palisade the spaniards advanced to the attack of the patriots position during the whole war no more desperate encounter took place than that upon the dyke which was but six paces wide the fight was long and furious three times the spaniards were repulsed with tremendous loss and while the patriot soldiers fought their pioneers still carried on the destruction of the dyke a fourth assault was likewise repulsed but the fifth was more successful the spaniards believed that they were led by a dead commander who had fallen some months before and this superstitious belief inspired them with fresh courage the entrenchment was carried but its defenders fought as obstinately as before on the dyke behind it just at this moment the vessels of the zealanders began to draw off many had been sunk or disabled by the fire that the forts had maintained on them and the rest found the water sinking fast for the tide was now ebbing 
the patriots believing that they were deserted by the fleet were seized with a sudden panic and leaving the dyke tried to wade or swim off to the ships the spaniards with shouts of victory pursued them the english and scotch were the last to abandon the position they had held for seven hours and most of them were put to the sword two thousand in all were slain or drowned the remainder succeeded in reaching the ships on one side or other of the dyke ned martin had fought to the last he was standing side by side with justinius of nassau and the two sprang together into a clump of high rushes tore off their heavy armor and swam out to one of the zealand ships which at once dropped down the river and reached the sea ned's mission was now at an end and he at once returned to england the failure of the attempt upon the Covenston dyke sealed the fate of antwerp it resisted until the middle of june when finding hunger staring the city in the face and having no hope whatever of relief sante aldegonde yielded to the clamor of the mob and opened negotiations these were continued for nearly two months parma was unaware that the town was reduced to such an extremity and consented to give honorable terms the treaty was signed on the seventeenth of august there was to be a complete amnesty for the past royalist absentees were to be reinstated in their positions monasteries and churches to be restored to their former possessors the inhabitants of the city were to practice the catholic religion only while those who refused to conform were allowed two years for the purpose of winding up their affairs all prisoners with the exception of teligny were to be released four hundred thousand florins were to be paid by the city as a fine and the garrison were to leave the town with arms and baggage and all honors of war the fall of antwerp brought about with it the entire submission of brabant and flanders and henceforth the war was continued solely by zealand holland and friesland the death of the prince of orange and the fall of antwerp marked the conclusion of what may be called the first period of the struggle of the netherlands for freedom it was henceforth to enter upon another phase england which had long assisted holland privately with money and openly by the raising of volunteers for her service was now about to enter the arena boldly and to play an important part in the struggle which after a long period of obstinate strife was to end in the complete emancipation of the netherlands from the yoke of spain sir edward martin married gertrude von harp soon after his return to england he retained the favor of elizabeth to the day of her death and there were few whose counsels had more influence with her he long continued in the public service although no longer compelled to do so as a means of livelihood for as holland and zealand freed themselves from the yoke of spain and made extraordinary strides in wealth and prosperity the estates of the countess once more produced a splendid revenue and this at her death came entirely to her daughter a considerable portion of sir edward martin's life when not actually engaged upon public affairs was spent upon the broad estates which had come to him from his wife end of chapter twenty one end of by pike and dyke a tale of the rise of the dutch republic by g a henty